If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. Oh, our boy came back into town, man. Always a good time seeing our boy Matt. Yeah. Matt's a Matt's a great dude, man. He's just a chill guy. Yeah, I love hanging out with that he, guy. He is. He's he's fun people. He's down to earth. He's a smart guy. Easy going, man. He's you know. There's there's some people that when we first meet him, I just I'm like, man, if if we knew each other growing up, or if you lived in my town, there's no doubt in my mind that we'd be, You'd be one of our guys. Yeah, we'd be kicking it all the time because he's such a he's such a cool dude. He's so hilarious, man. And yeah. Justin and him are like little bosom buddies. Yeah, yeah. You know? yeah he's like he's like my long lost brother. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I mean, guy. didn't you guys make a video in the sauna or something like that? Yeah. They did like an hour. They were in there for an hour. Just, we're just doting on each other, really. really? They, they didn't go anywhere. <laughs> just, just, <laughs> I was like, where's this going, bro? We didn't know. I like your yeah. tattoos. Yeah. I, I That's like that. Like that. You're cool. <laughs> yeah, let's hang out. No, and his, his podcast is doing pretty well. Uh, Matt, uh, he's the host of the Um So podcast. Uh, you know, he's such a, he has such a great attitude about uh, podcasting and what he's doing. And I think and we talk a little bit about building a, a business, a podcasting and apparel line. Like he's got a yeah, very- Yeah, because he's got a successful- Line. He's got a very successful apparel. In fact, that's most of how he monetizes, and he's done a really good job doing that. And so he gives some great. Yeah, insight. I was writing notes for sure. Yeah, he gave some great insight on uh, some of the do's and don'ts of building a business like that. And you know what I like is his attitude of he literally flies to so many of these people. Um, on his own dime, and a lot of times to interview them, which that doesn't translate into a bunch of dollars for him and his business. And we know what that was like. I mean, mm -hmm. many people don't know this, but much of the early days of Mind Pump, we used to have to pay and fly all of our guests. We want to interview. We not only are it's we are we interviewing them, but we're also paying for them to come out, fly out here, and stay with us. We had to do that for a long time. An when investment we, in the future. Yeah, it was. And I think I think a lot of guys and girls that are starting podcasts don't think about that or don't realize that that may be something that they uh, could or should do as as they're starting off. And I, Matt touches on that, and that's something that I think he embodies. Yeah, he just has the right attitude about it. And I think that a lot of people aren't willing to do stuff like that that really will help get them those kind of connections, that network established. So it's like, yeah, of course, you know, if he ever has something going on, we're going to promote it, we're going to help him out because he just has that that kind of an attitude going forward. There's some funny stories, too. We talked about some of the, his first sales jobs and where he learned his sales skills and yeah. when he worked at the strip club and how he lost his business the first time and had to get back on his feet. And oh, that's right. His strip, strip club stories yeah, are epic. It, it, some really, really good stories. So again, his podcast is Um So. You can find him on Instagram at I H V I I I Matt Vincent, or his website, which is the H V I I I dot com. That's the hate in Roman numerals or eight, excuse me, with an H in front of it, Roman numerals. Uh, and that's his website. So without any further ado, here we are interviewing our good friend Matt Vincent. You got a good radio voice, Matt. Is that is that true? Yeah, you do. I don't know that I feel that way. I've always felt my voice is really weird. No, really? it's, it's yeah, no, man. But that's what makes it good. Yeah. Okay, you yeah. got that. It's uh, unique. What do you call that? Like the <laughs> Louisiana twang or yeah. something going yeah, on? Yeah, but there's not a yeah, tone to it. I don't. Yeah. I what, don't sound like swamp yeah, people. Well, school. We're gonna head on down to buy and shoot them, boys. <laughs> no, no, no. Get down there. Yeah. No, I have an I have an uncle Whoa. from St. Louis. That is so. a boiling hot pot of gumbo. <laughs> <laughs> Is there, is there, uh, isn't that funny how some accents and some like are super like if you go to a bar and start talking that way, all the girls want to talk to you. Some of them, it's not, just the different accent. Yeah, it's you essentially think so? yeah because like like Does Australian that chicks here? aren't impressed with Australian accents. Mm. So but, like you southern southern gentlemen show up in Australia and and don't look like chewed bubble gum. I'm assuming you. Have like lay of the land. Well, it's not true for all accents, <laughs> though, right? Because like some are Dude, more valuable than others. You know what? I, that I love is your sayings from there are just <laughs> the best. Yeah, I know. I what know, did you say know. earlier? Like chicken, weird chickens, teeth. fucked up like chicken teeth. Yeah, yeah fucked up is. like chicken teeth. <laughs> there it is. Horse, yeah, horse I, feathers. I'm gonna use that. Yeah. Yeah. Dude, it's good shit. Can you share some more sayings? More sayings? Oh man, I'm sure there's, there's a bunch that aren't acceptable. What? Uh, <laughs> weird, right? I know that seems strange yeah. from the south. Nah. <laughs> um. Darker than three foot up a cow's ass is what? one of my favorites. Whoa. Oh my god, it's a good one. <laughs> yeah. That is dark. Yeah. yeah, it'd be fucking super black. <laughs> you wouldn't be able to see, <laughs> see anything. Uh, higher than giraffe pussy. I don't think that's a southern one though. Yeah, I've heard that one. Fuck, higher yeah, than yeah. giraffe. Pussy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, fucked you know, up. Yeah, fucked up like horse feathers. Uh, soup sandwich. 
What's a soup sandwich? Yeah, fucked up like a soup sandwich. Oh, okay. oh yeah, yeah. Or like a football bat. <laughs> <laughs> you know what sucks about this is every time you say one, I picture it. Yeah, I, uh, you have yeah, to. Yeah, that's the thing. So it's the visual that sells it. When you said giraffe pussy, I was like, oh, yeah. that's pretty high. <laughs> I got I to gotta get on my tippy toes. You need a stick to it. <laughs> yeah. That is high. Yeah. Yeah, so you guys, we were talking before we got on air, we were talking about uh, the whole marijuana thing, and it's starting to make its way out towards you now, yeah? Trying, dude. Trying. It seems... I'm fairly certain we've passed medical law, but there's nowhere you can get it. So I don't know what. Yeah, what they do is do. they pass a law, but then they regulate the shit out of it. Yeah, so yeah of course. The transition's always funny. It's like, oh, you can now legally buy it, but you can't smoke it. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's illegal. Oh, oh, there you go. Doug's there messing around over there. Right. Yeah, and you know, it. so I allegedly we're supposed to be getting our first medical dispensary. So if that happens, I'm going to bet that it's going to be hard to get a card. Yeah. It won't be. There's not going to be a bunch of shops on Venice Beach opening up with Probably. doctors in them for 40 bucks. But is it weird for you to come to California and go to a dispensary? <clears throat> yeah, dude, it's still it's still strange. Uh like going to a dispensary, there's definitely a bit of like anxiety and nervousness that I'm not supposed to or I'm going to say something wrong. <laughs> you don't got the lingo down. <laughs> yeah, like I'm, I just look like a kook and you know you kind of just I want some fit weed. In. Yeah. 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 I'll take look some how of that. Great uh, this is. I'm a tourist. <laughs> I'll take some of that light that light depot greenhouse <laughs> yeah. 6040 uh indica right, yeah. please. Then you, you know, go to you go to a dispensary. You guys with, have some joints? You go to a dispensary <laughs> yeah. with me and Adam and we're like grabbing the bud with Smelling, hmm, this one's got hints of citrus. Nice. <laughs> you think I'm joking right now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's true. Yeah, we get into long snobs. We get long conversations over it. But yeah, they reg- if they regulate it enough, there's just gonna be another black market. It reminds me of uh, like in New York. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a big ass black market for cigarettes in New York. Lucy's. Yeah, because exactly because they've they've taxed it so much that th- it's now become you know uh, cheaper to, to well, buy, just, buy it in bulk well, some guy will show up with a someone who's going to drive down to a different state and right. buy that's right. the carton and then yeah. drive it back that's yeah. what they'll end up doing if they regulate like if they tax it too high here in california it's just gonna be a black market for it well i think yeah. it's i don't think it got rid of the black market at all i really don't i think for the i think for the most part there's still i mean i was showing you guys some stuff just recently there's still stuff that doesn't even make it into the clubs because the black market will will pay for the wholesaler significantly higher for that quality of product. So it doesn't even make it mm. into the clubs as a, someone who used to grow. And, and well, is it, is it when you say black market will pay more <clears throat> than the open market? Is it because they're sending it to States and stuff that are, it's a, so there's a high demand cause it's illegal in other States. Yeah. For oh, sure. yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, I mean, so that's the, and that's existed for quite some time now. That's not going away. Cause I would assume that if you were in a state like let's say Louisiana, where it's far more regulated, if you wanted really good weed, it probably, and you buy it in the black market, there it probably came from a place like California, Colorado. Yeah, oh yeah. Anytime, like I guess that I had gotten weed in the past or something like huh. that, you know, essentially. And I'm relatively new to this; like I didn't start smoking until in my 30s. But it's you know like oh yeah, you know we got stuff from California. It's like anytime someone who now has weed in Louisiana, it's either that or they make trips to Denver. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. What what? Why didn't you smoke it before? Um, dude, I just I had jobs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. responsibility yeah, yeah. things. Yeah, yeah, that's what it boils down to. I had jobs. Yeah, I had track and field through college. You know, so we were drug tested, and then after that, I had jobs that I was drug tested at. What do you use it for now? Uh, pain relief, uh, fun, anti anxiety helps with appetite. Also, a sleep better. Yeah, you know, a lot of people say they use it for for pain. I never got pain relief from it myself mm. uh but a lot of people say it really works well yeah. for them for i'm pain. not sure if i get pain relief right like it's not like taking <clears throat> it's not like when you get drunk and don't notice you fucking smashed into a wall <laughs> but it's <laughs> it's like uh i just give less of a fuck about it i think that's probably right that sounds about accurate yeah. no i think i think it does it doesn't it it doesn't feel localized though like um you know, if you were to if you were to get like a shot a shot in it, mm-hmm. right? Like a, a shot of cortisone inside of it, it would that gives you like this instant yeah, release like in the numb right, it, like, right, 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 where right. You, I feel like when you you have a high enough dose of that, and you're you're seeking uh, you know pain relief, so you're getting something probably higher in CBD. Yeah, well, and you get kind of this what they call what we used to call like a body high. Yeah, for sure. Right, mm-hmm. where you just you just feel you sink into the couch yeah. and relax, and so I think that's where you get the you know quote unquote. I would agree because there's definitely anti-inflammatory properties with uh, with cannabis, but it's not it's there's there are some acute anti-inflammatory properties, but it's not massive. So like you're not going to get as big of an anti-inflammatory effect from having cannabis acutely as you would from like taking ibuprofen, right? Take ibuprofen. Yeah, but then you're not fucking with your liver. There's a bunch of other... Yeah, uh, but what I think 
part of the pain relieving is what Adam's talking about because a, a lot of pain is not just connected to the actual pain of the pain itself, but the feelings around that pain. Mm-hmm. So because like emotionally, yo, oh, come on, dude. <laughs> you know it's funny. You know you say that, but uh, one of the biggest off-label uses of antidepressant drugs is for uh, pain, where people have back pain and they can't figure out what the cause is. They'll put them on a, on an SSRI and oh, my back pain's gone. Weird, yeah, man. yeah very All strange. Mind. Yeah, dude, pain's one of the Sometimes hardest things to crazy. treat. Well, well you see examples of this uh, when you hurt yourself and. You don't look at it at first, and then you look at it and you see oh, it. Oh, for sure. Yep. And especially if it's a bad one, and it comes like, oh, rushing in. After then that. all of a sudden, the yeah. pain comes rushing in after the yeah. fact, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the worst. I got I took a discus to the shin. Oh, oh my god! In college, God, damn. I was gonna be cool and jump over it as it came at me. I did not. Took a higher hop than I was expecting. <laughs> Whoops! That's like the worst karate chop ever. Oh yeah, it smashed yeah. me right in the shin. And I was like, Ugh. like <laughs> pulled my sock down. And I was like. Okay, we're all right. And then there's like just white spot. Oh, like, oh no. And it just, bleh, it's, <laughs> what it, what, blood fell out. What would that look like the next day? Like a giant shitty scab Ugh. and a bruise. <laughs> <laughs> and I limped around for two weeks. Oh, man. How's your knee, by the way? Dude, it is way better. It um. What was the <clears> procedure <throat> you had again? And Which one? Yeah, let's, let's, let's so, give us a short recap if you don't mind. So, so people- we've done meniscectomies, two. Uh, we've had two other scope procedures. We three ACLs, an oats procedure where they oh, wait, what's, um, what's oats? Is that what oats they take the like, hamstring? No, that's all cartilage. So it's like they cut like a thirty millimeter <clears throat> plug into the bottom of your femur, and they put a fresh new cartilage plug in it. Oh shit! Damn. So that one's been kind of exciting. Um, so we did the oats procedure, and then the high tibial osteotomy was the last like major surgery. Is that where they remove some of the tibia? Yeah, they wedge it open mm-hmm. to change the angle of my leg so that they can put the pressure on the side of my knee where there's more cartilage that works. Now, I know, you, Matt, you have a, a pretty uh, strict regimen that you follow. I watch uh, what you do in the, the pl- hot, cold plunging. Yeah. What have been some like, cause, and I'm, I'm recovering right now with my Achilles, which has been by far the worst injury I've ever personally Ugh. experienced. And you know, what has been some like go-to things for you that like you definitely have noticed, like this gives me a lot of relief. And so it's been a, a staple in your, in your regimen. Uh, the hot and cold has been really nice. I mean, the hot, because I mean, it's, it's great to sit in the hot tub. Like first thing in the morning, I can kind of loosen up and stretch and try to get through the knee in a way that like body weight is supported because I'm in the pool. So I can kind of do some, a little bit more passive stretching than just mm-hmm. killing myself in the gym, mm-hmm. right. you know, trying to stretch that early. And then I've actually got a cold tub. And uh, that, that'll that shut the knee up. Like if it's pissed and gets really inflamed, like I've been on a walk or trained or did something stupid because it still just gets aggravated, I can I can dump it in there for a couple minutes and it, it shuts up. Yeah. So has that become like a, a staple thing that you do every day? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, my, my morning routine is is get up and it's um hot tub stretch, uh, drink some water. I do a little bit of work with like a mace bell to just kind of general mobility, move around, get the heart going. And then I start having coffee after, oh, yeah, cold tub and then coffee. When did you put that all together? Have you been doing that for a long time or was it finally after? It's slowly built, dude. It's slowly built over the last year and just different advice from different people I've got to talk to and, you know, what was good recommendations. And it's it's just now that's the routine that works. Right. You know. Yeah, it's uh, I, I do. Uh, so I don't have a cold plunge or anything like that. But what I do every single morning is I go after my workout, I go shower and I do really hot water and I try to get it to a point where it's almost unbearable. So it's really, really hot. That's how I shower. And then at the end I do a 30 minute, excuse me, 30 second, not 30 minute, 30 second, like as cold as it is, the shower will go kind of a rinse. Yeah. And it's the single easiest, but also single most impactful thing I can do. At least that that's, that's that easy that I've done so far in terms of improving my health. It almost, you know what it feels like? Because in the morning I'll wake up at five and right about 5.15 or so I'll have a little bit of caffeine and that caffeine will take me through my workout. And what happens sometimes with me with caffeine is after my workout and I'll eat a little bit and then I'll go, you know, get ready and shower or whatever, is I'll get that energy dip afterwards a little mm-hmm. bit. But the cold rinse after the heat, it's it's almost like I have more <clears throat> caffeine and it lasts until the afternoon so it's like this extra energy that i get and then the the science surrounding cold dips this is not dips or even just showers we actually talked about this on a previous podcast 
they took a, a bunch of people. It was a pretty large study, and they had them do a 20 second, 20 to 30 second cold rinse every morning. That's it in the shower. Nothing crazy. And they tracked them over the course of I think a couple of years, and a couple of things happened. One, when the study was over, something like seventy percent of the people uh, kept continued doing the cold rinsing. So like seventy percent of the people chose to voluntarily do it because they saw so yeah, much benefit. Seventy percent. That's huge. That's huge. Thirty percent of the uh, they had a thirty percent reduction in uh, cold, in infections. So cold sickness, whatever. Thirty percent from the cold. Just from taking a cold Just shower. Just from cold. Thir- oh, I've talked about minutes. this before. The, the, out of all the things, like, you know, you talk about, Matt, that's why I was curious about when, where, when and where you picked it up. I mean, like you, we've had an opportunity to talk to a lot of brilliant minds, and everybody has their two cents of, like, oh, you should add this into your regimen or you should do this. Uh, this probably one of the single most impactful things is the hot cold plunge for me personally. And for and I, I think the reason for that is I've always thought of myself as somebody who has a weak immune system because I used to get sick all the time. I used to attribute that to being in the gym. I was like, oh, I'm, I'm always in the gym. I've worked in this for 15 years and there's sweaty hands all over shit. Do you think there was a family member poisoning you? <laughs> yeah, right. Or a family member that was trying to poison. <laughs> what's, that, what's that condition? <laughs> Munchausen syndrome? Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I just assumed that it was always bad. And um, I don't remember who it was that really kicked us off into doing, you know, the hot cold plunge. And then, uh, you know, we had Wim Hof here. And, yeah. And then started to incorporate the showers first before I started to plunge as much. And then I started, and I didn't really, wasn't even watching this marker. And I realized like, shit, it's been a fucking long time that I got sick. And it used to be when we all worked together, man, if Sal came in, he was sick. Or if Justin was sick, I was guaranteed I'm sick. Like there's right. no way I'm get gonna, it worse than anybody. Yeah. And then I get it worse than yeah. anybody in longer. Crazy. Yeah. So, and I, I just always have to be the best. We took all of our STDs <laughs> at once. Yeah, it's no, it's it's, Home run. it's yeah. been it's been one of the things that I like to share with people because it, it's been such a game changer for me. So um, I, I've continued to do it, and I and I yeah, know and it's what, something anyone can do. Right, it's easy, it's cheap, it's free. Yeah, it's yeah, it's the same cost <laughs> as whatever your water is. You just have to suffer a little. <laughs> right, it's probably yeah. cheaper because you're not running hot water. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Exactly. Right. You actually save money by doing probably point. one of those. It's exhilarating. <laughs> right, yeah. right. Well, so so uh, in Russia, that's like a it's like part of their culture. Eastern Europe, it's part of their culture. And you can go on YouTube and see some of these elementary schools and stuff for kids where it's snowing outside and part of their recess or whatever oh, is yeah. to they'll run outside. They'll, they'll all get in their bathing suits and, and they'll they run jump out, out in the snow. And go play yeah. in the snow Make and like the, snow angels. And, then, yeah. and they'll fill up buckets of water and these are little <laughs> I've seen that. I know it's crazy. They're little kids, kids are like they're that. like six years old or yeah. you know, seven years old. And it, man, can I tell you something right now? If 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 in America we saw a school doing that to kids, they, I know. they would throw them in jail. It's so well, taboo, Iceland, but like think Iceland what it's doing for their way. yeah. Say what? Like Iceland gets that way. That like it's just nothing to you know <sighs> when you're there in the winter, like kids still go to school, and it's dark outside, what twenty hours a day, and it's cold as shit. And it's like snow, and you'll just see these like kids standing outside, like on a bank, like, <laughs> walking walk to school by themselves. And it's dark. It's really a weird like, where what's going on? Yeah, you, you, it's we were just talking about this. Sal just spoke at the Spartan race uh, um, just recently, this last weekend, and it's funny what we've seen in the last. I don't know. It's only been about five years, you know, maybe five or eight years that these. Uh, real popular, uh, these muddy buddies, the tough mudders, mm-hmm. the Spartan races of they're just exploding, dude, exploding. And I think one of the the prevailing theories for us is that it's this we're now in this generation that is so plugged in, and we just don't comfortable. Yeah, we're so comfortable, we don't ever have to overcome adversity. No, and, not at all. And especially, I mean, think about us. Like our generation, we grew up with the computer, right? That it, it started in our generation for sure. And it's now evolved to where it's now in the palm of your hand 24-7. And we really haven't seen what that's kind of doing to us as a society. But I think that this is an example of what I think some people are, some of these smarter people are already picking up on it. Like You need it. You need that. I I wonder if I, yeah. Challenge. I wonder, can I still climb over a seven-foot wall? Can I still climb a rope? You know, can I still do all these things I could do 15 Can I get dirty? (laughs) Nobody gets fucking dirty anymore. People, right? Like, like as a species, we're, we're really good at adapting to stress. That's, that's one of the things that we do very, very well. And it's, it's pretty rad that we live in a time that, uh, we're not hunted. Uh, I'm relatively never going to be hungry. Right. 
and I can be comfortable. Like my house is climate controlled. My car is climate controlled. The place I'll go to work is climate controlled. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you don't even have to deal with environmental temperature swings anymore for your body. And so it's cool. We live in a time now that we can pick the stress we want. Mm -hmm. Like I can say, I want to have the stress of from lifting weights to build muscle. I don't need any of the muscle I've right, right. I don't have to go wrestle a bull and fuck right. it. Yeah, right. yeah. Or, or I, I got to make that choice because I didn't have to go lay 10 acres of fence posts today. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. It's just, I didn't have to deal with any of that. I didn't have to shovel out coal from a mine. And so, you mean I get to have cold water on me? Like, no. as a choice? Like, that's <laughs> yeah. the, the stress that we get to pick. But our body doesn't have any of those natural adaptations anymore because things are comfortable and awesome. Right, it is. They're comfortable. And what's awesome is that we get to choose it. But what's not awesome is I think people don't realize that that it's important. We need it. Yeah, right. You need the stresses. You you need it. And you know, put yourself. I mean, for for people who might be disagreeing, like put yourself in a comfortable, cushy bed and stay in there and don't move and have people bring you food and have just wear a diaper and crap yourself and people change Mm -hmm. your diaper and just stay in there and see what kind of personal hell it becomes, not just physically but mentally. Have fun with those bed sores. Yeah. 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 So yeah. we need, it's like we need challenge, but challenge is hard. But challenge is what we adapt to, right? And so it also gives us meaning. Yeah. Like, I mean, that's one of those things. Well, it's like the leading cause of death is retirement. Right. Which is People crazy. People stop having a job, they fucking die. Dude, have yeah. you seen the statistics on that? It's crazy. It's ridiculous. After retirement, I think that like all cause mortality explodes within the first few years. Yeah. It's insane. Wild. It's insane. We need uh, we purpose, need to have that purpose, challenge for sure. We need that stuff, and um, I think we forget, you know, and we forget when we raise our kids. Even like, in fact, we don't want our kids to be challenged. Yeah, yeah, that's a weird one, man. Like, that's something I've been kind of thinking about. Is you don't have kids, yeah? No, no, no. And so with with the way things are, I think that we're trying to like with medication and with you know participation trophies and and all this other type of shit. It's like we're trying to cut off both sides of the spectrum. Like, we don't want you to ever feel really bad, but we're also going to take away you ever feeling really great. Mm-hmm. And so they just kind of live in this world where winning or losing doesn't matter. Or doing this, you don't have that big of a difference in the reward versus, you know, the effort. Right. And so, I mean, we medicate away from people feeling on either side of that spectrum so that they can just go through the middle. And I don't know if that tied up of, I don't know. Autonomy or whatever. Is. No, it's terrible. No. It's actually terrible. Well, First, I remember an example that that we watched happen at the, a company that all three of us worked at, and they they what they started doing. This was kind of like the last straw for me when I was there. Was they they kept every comp plan. So I went through seven different comp plan changes in ten years. It's a lot, right? And every time a comp plan change comes out, it's, it's for the benefit of the company. It's, yeah, it's a they're huge trying to save money. The ass too. Yeah, yeah. But what they, what they are trying to do is they are trying to get these guys. Uh, they they are trying to cap. The, the people that were producing a ton and making a ton of money because it was based that way, they are trying to bring them down and they're trying to bring like all the shit butts that were milking the system kind of up and then mm-hmm. everybody be in this middle and it totally backfired. Mm-hmm. I mean, what it did was it was the, the people that were really driven to push push harder. They all left because it's like a, we have you nothing know, to what, push. Exactly. I remember that distinctively. It's like we all were, were pressing each other so hard to get these, to be the best in the company, be, get all these trophies, get the accolades, all that stuff. But like, you know, you throw shit like that out there. You know, I'm just going to coast at that point. You know, I'm going to look for something else somewhere else. I mean, it, it's that stuff with socialism that makes me nervous. Oh, especially that, with, exactly. oh my God. You know, a, a, with a country this size, right? Yeah. Like, and I don't know Iceland's uh, you know, government set up that well. They're actually very, they're very free market. They have socialist uh, components. Thing. Yeah, well, they med- medical stuff, but education. they're very free market. In fact, their markets are, I believe, ranked higher than ours, even in market in, in and, and freedom I think, index. And I think part of the deal there, right? Like you can do some of those things. Like I know, um, like if you have a kid, you guys have like nine months of maternity leave to split between mom and dad. Sure. So, I mean, if you both want four and a half months off of work, cool, but there's nine total. And the government pays 85% of what your salary is. And then typically the companies over there match the le- the rest of it so that you, you know, can stay home. And th- I think that stuff works well and good when they have a 2% unemployment rate. Mm. It, it, it works. You, there's always a trade-off. So who's paying for all that? Well, you're, you're paying it in either taxes, you're paying it in – Lower productivity, less efficiency. You're paying mm-hmm. for it, and less innovation. So there's always a there's always a trade off. 
And the, my argument always is, if there's a demand for it, then the market will provide for it. And if there's not a demand for it, we can only look to ourselves. So in a free market society, if people really did value that time off and everybody demanded it, well, employers would compete for employees by offering that kind of stuff. So what's happening there is you're getting legislation that's saying this is how it should be. You know, that that's more of an uh, of an economic uh, discussion, but you know, I I am reading a book right now by Carl Jung, who's the the great psychoanalyst. He was uh, the uh, top student of uh, Freud. And it's Undiscovered Self is the book I'm reading. I'm not completely done with it, but he talks about the dangers of uh, collectivism where and we all know the dangers of mob mentality, right. mob rule. We know what happens when you weaken the individual and try to strengthen the group. They become very easy to manipulate, and it becomes a situation where, where all you need is a charismatic leader to provide false uh, feelings of, uh, you know, of, of, of meaning. People love and, being misled. And people do crazy shit. Yeah. So really, it's, uh, uh, really the, 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 the true way or the, the best way to move forward is to understand that uh, in, in individualism, in your own individual self, your own individual rights, respect those in others and nobody's better than anybody else in that respect except for when you think a right is something you can take from someone else which it's not um and in that people have different characters so they'll have different value because some people are fucking more productive and some people are better and some people aren't but if you want to change things like you want to change society start with the thing that you can you have the absolute biggest and most impact over and really the only thing that truly honestly uh, really exists because society is just a collection of individuals, right? It's not really what is society. It's just a bunch of individual people. So you, so what you do is you focus on you. So if everybody focused on themselves, how can we all change us? How can we change society or whatever you want to call it? We just focus on changing ourselves, and then everything changes. Right. If we focus on this group think and 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 start to dissolve our own the individual with that is sovereignty the, the amount of self awareness that it takes for for a free market to exist that's the problem it's that's, it's called responsibility that's it and that's just it but we don't have it and I, no. that's and i think that the argument so the argument to your against your side is that people want to be led People want to be told what to do. People don't want to dig deeper in. People don't want to try and figure out. And that is the well. The world needs ditch diggers too, right? Of course, nothing you know wrong I mean? with that. And no, there's nothing wrong with yeah. it. But there's going to be people that that aren't going to have that drive. There's also going to be for every guy that you've got that is a Elon Musk, you're going to have the other side of the spectrum. Totally right. And so, and and here's the deal: like uh, you want, you don't want to have a society where everybody gets exactly the same stuff. And here's why. I want somebody like Elon Musk or the late Steve Jobs or Bill Gates or, you know, whoever. I want those guys who are extremely intelligent, who innovate, who also dedicate way more hours, time, and and, and, and effort into what they're doing than anybody else or most people are willing to do. Yeah. I want those people to make most of our shit and I want them to get benefit from it. Yeah, and reward from it, right. I don't want I don't want it to be where a guy like that doesn't get to create the most opportunities because he's the smarter dude. Yeah, just because there's no reward for it. Yeah, there's and, no reason to put in that. And how do we determine that? Well, we, we create a system where his the way he benefits is by creating things that other people want. That's it. Now, there is some, there is some stuff I like about like a universal basic income that I like. Mm. You know, just... Um, I always, always think about stuff like this, right? Like, like drowning people make bad decisions. And so I think if people get caught in that state, right, where you're, even if you're trying to make a good move and say you're, you know, making no money and you've got a kid or you got a, you know, a car that sucks because you don't make any money. And so let's, I mean, let's say you're scrounging and saving the most you can and it's 150 bucks a month, right? It's a great start. But then you have a flat tire on your car it's shit's gone you know you're out 600 bucks or whatever it is and then you're back to zero like these people you're in that position you can't ever make the step to the next thing to not be drowning right no that that's uh, uh that exists 100 percent. there's a couple a couple things you want to examine when you look at that the first thing is uh from a moral standpoint from a moral standpoint the moral argument is this uh First off, the the only burden that lies within uh, a situation 
um, in terms of, for example, the burden of, of you taking care of yourself lies within you, no one else. That's the moral, that's that's 100% uh, accurate in terms of morality. Now, is it desirable that other people help you? I think so, 100%. I think there's also a moral argument to say that other people should help, but should they be forced? No. Would an ideal society, in an ideal situation, you would have a society in which people help each other voluntarily. Right, right. In which- Which it forces you to be a good person. Right. You know I'm saying it, like, I, if I right. know that I, I want to have lots of, an, 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 you know, I want to have a large network of people that like me and care about me. And probably when I'm in a situation like that, they, w- they would voluntarily help the, take care of things. The biggest right? charity, the, the, the most charity, the most voluntary help is given by free wealthy societies compared to non-free not wealthy society, oh, for sure, even in right? comparison to how much they make. But I, th- I think, I think where a lot of that gets lost is is sense of community and tribe and stuff like totally. that, where people don't feel accountable to the people around them. Like, mm. I mean, I'm fortunate enough that the neighbors that live next to us are really fucking good friends, and so like we hang out and share dinners and do these type of things, right? But like, I don't know the people that live across the street from me mm-hmm. at all, and so. Yeah, it just what a different life it would be if, like, you and the ten people that you really liked all lived on a cul-de-sac. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah sure. And, and 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 we just imagine that house. You you would feel so safe too, like that. Oh, house. Of course, right. Yeah. The problem is my ten people are across the country. They're yeah. not ten yeah. people that. Yeah. No, I definitely think I definitely think it's desirable and 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 good for people to take care of each other. One hundred percent. Now, how do we get to a state a, a society like that? Well, well, that's we, where the accountability part plays right. in, but I don't know how you, that's the you question. build it. That's right. The question is, how do we go from where we are now yeah. to something like that? I don't think you take a system like we have now and eliminate welfare because no. you have so many people dependent on the system that if you did that, you would you would cause a lot of problems. You'd cause a lot of civil unrest, but you'd also cause like maybe death, starvation. Right. Um, you'd cause- It would be- a, there, You'd also have a spike in crime, right? Because there's definitely- Sure. I mean, look, that sucks to say, but that's one of the reasons that we, we came up with welfare was so that if we can give someone enough, they won't steal from us. Part of it. That may be part of it. But how do we go from where we're at now to a purely voluntary society? I think there's steps. And I think one of the steps is what you talked about. I, I think a universal basic income, eliminating all welfare and replacing it with cash or is or a, just a superior. What about, say, the first 30 grand you make is just not taxable? Yeah, it's a negative income tax. That's uh, Milton Friedman talks about that, and that's kind of along the lines of, uh, you know, what I would what I would probably support more of. But then from there, you'd want to move further and further to a, a purely voluntary society. But the way to do that is to eliminate all barriers to enter the market. Eliminate all barriers so that people, if they want to start a business. They don't have to do all this bullshit. You know, I read this, this story about I this woman. I don't, I don't think we can make it all the way to a truly free society like that. I don't. I don't I think, think it's. I don't know. If I don't. Think- I, the reason why I don't believe it's possible is because I. I think that we wouldn't be able to stomach what would happen if we're in a truly free space space like that where we don't help anybody. It's all voluntary. There'd be a lot of people that died off. And we and the stronger would survive, the weaker would die off. And as a society, we would not be able to bear that, and handle that, because the, and that's the truth. So it's here's the fact of the matter: so what would happen? Here's why I disagree with that. I, I first off, I think it's a goal. I don't know if we'd ever get there, but I think it's a uh, I think it's a an honorable goal. And of course, we'd have to assess along the way if it's working or not. But the best evidence we have is this: when you look at the world and you look at history. This, the, the, the single most effective thing that's lifted people out of poverty in pure numbers and in pure efficiency and effectiveness, the single thing that has fed more people and housed more people and clothed more people are free markets, not a single or even cumulative government decree or anything. There's no socialized anything that has come even close. You have countries like China, you had the Soviet Union who basically guaranteed, that was their government, we guarantee everybody gets a place to live and food to eat and whatever. The result of that was mass yeah. starvation, mass, mass deaths. You had reductions in innovation, reductions in freedom. You had incredible uh, inequality and poverty. And then you had countries like the U.S., which prior to, prior to the 1900s, we, it was almost entirely voluntary. We had no income tax whatsoever. Uh, our borders were open. You wanted to be an immigrant. You just came here and we made you an immigrant. And yet, 
in America, we saw the reduction in poverty. It blew away anything that everybody, anybody had ever seen. And then the 20th century was a reflection of that worldwide where you had markets freeing up worldwide. You had the, 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 the falling of the, the, you know, the uh, communism in the Soviet Union collapse. So the Iron Curtain came down. You saw East Germany, you know, the, the become, a, you know, all Germany became united. It became free market. You saw a reduction in poverty nobody's ever seen. So although it may sound counterintuitive, nothing's come close to it at all. Nothing. I mean, to the point where does starvation happen in Western societies with, with largely free markets? To the, far more people die of too much food. I mean, we have fat it's, homeless people. It's here. not even just, yeah. yeah, it's not even just the starvation piece that I think, I think you would see a lot of homeless people too. We'd, yeah. see, we'd have people roaming the streets that just you, haven't got their shit together, haven't figured it out. You, and that, you might, but I think- You would, I, you would, there's two- there's We two, have it now. Right, right. We, we have it now and it's not, that would just accelerate so that. The, so the question to me, the question that I would pro- say is this, if let's say, and I'm not, again, we're talking about a goal, so I, I don't know if it, if it, if it could exist, by the way, you're not a city planner. Yeah, yeah no, you know, <laughs> actually, actually, nobody is. Nobody's a planner. Like central planners are terrible because they can't predict all the moving parts. They just can't. All I know is is that when we let people work together and we eliminate the barriers to people working together, they tend to figure shit out. There tends to be markets, or they die off. Right. So th- again, that's exactly what would happen. Is some of us would figure that out. And come together and build our own communities and do all that stuff. And then lots of us wouldn't. And there I see what Sal's saying. We got to get rid of the lower class. (laughs) Not at all. Not at all. Any of these freeloaders, this is time. I tell you what. Sal (laughs) says, throw down the hatchet. Let's get rid of this. I tell you what. In the early early 20th century. I mean, I agree agree with Sal. So it's like, but at the same time, too, I also see the flaws in us going back. I think we might, we might have jumped the shark already. I feel like we might have gone too far with it, and we've turned it into such a, a, a welfare state, at least for us. But there, is, but it is such a different time than the 1900s, right? Because there's less jobs that are labor driven, right? Mm-hmm. Which is something that anyone can do. Like, man, if you're willing to actually work, we, we can do that. We have not that there isn't jobs available for that. There definitely are, but our society doesn't do that anymore because of eliminating. All these different things. You know, there, there's a quote I like, and it I'll probably butcher it, and it's something along the lines of like, you know, we'll be soldiers so our sons can be teachers, and we'll be teachers so that our sons can be artists. Mm. And we're there. That's what we did. So what the fuck happens after that? We're the artists. The artists are. Well, Arti- but you can't be mad that that's where we got. That was the plan. Yeah, well, no. What, it was, it, it would make AI. sense for it to be back to the soldiers. Is what yeah. it would make sense. Like the artists. Well, what do they say? Strong men create good times. Good times mm, create yeah. uh, weak men. Weak men create bad times. Bad times create strong men. Right. You know. So, so, so here's the thing with that. Uh, let's talk about barriers first off to enter the market. Do, do, does the average job today or the average work today require more skill or more experience than previous jobs? Perhaps, perhaps it does. So what are the barriers to getting that skill? Well, you got to go to school. You got to pay for school. You got to find information. You got to pay for information. What well, if, but, but that's but why to, I, but we I also, hate the fact that there aren't more apprenticeships the way things were, that you could learn one-on-one from someone in a, in a job you know, job setting. You're right. Mm-hmm. Well, my point is this. What do we have today that's completely eliminated all those barriers pretty much? Technology, for yeah. one. Oh, YouTube videos. Like, I, I tell you what. There's, it, dude. There are, there's two or three homeless people that live out here uh, near our facility, and, and every once in a while I'll give them money or food or whatever. Every single one of them has a cell phone. Of course every, they do. Every single one of them. A fucking cell phone, which a thousand dollar device in their pocket that has all the information of forever. I want to know what plan they're on because I want to jump on. Well, let me tell you something. A cell phone, Verizon, dude. If you have a cell phone, you just walk over. (laughs) You walk over Starbucks and you get free Wi Fi. A a cell phone when they first came out, which was I don't know 1970 something. In those dollars, not even adjusted for inflation, was something like a thousand dollars, and it was shit, and it was just a phone. Okay, today what the market has brought us. The free market, government, didn't, there was no socialized anything to do this. It eliminated all those barriers to become skillful or to learn information, so much so that homeless people. Yeah. I actually have to just know. read an article too that was yeah. like describing how we're all kind of shifting more into skill based, you know, workforce. Like, like, 
everybody's going more into like going into an actual trade again. So that, that's going to be like a commodity going forward, which is interesting. It, 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 I mean, whatever. Well, because it has, cause there's fucking jobs. Sure. Because right? like, yeah. if, if you want a job right now, go be an electrician. Right. There's oh, yeah. work. There's, or there's learn high to demand weld. right now. Totally. Yeah. Learn to weld, you'll have a job and get paid forever. Totally. But so, so here's my, my point with all of this is regardless of do we think we can get there or if that's an ideal situation. It's a good goal no matter what. We're, it's a good goal, but we're going there anyway. I hate to tell you, break this to you, but you can try regulating and socializing whatever you want. It's all getting out competed by the market anyway. Even the untouchable parts of our government, like the FDA, which hardly anybody, if I were to go make an argument, let's say I was a politician and I was making the speech and I'm like, we need more free markets. And then everybody's like, yay. And then I said, eliminate the FDA. Nobody would vote for me. Everybody like, no, 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 no. We need the, the Food and Drug Administration. I want safe food. Well, guess what's going to happen in about 10 years? Yeah. There's a device right now. I know because I see it. I know can't that wait. It's already, it's already in, in, in prototypes. So and like it's a spe- effective. spectrometer or whatever. It like, scans your food and lets you know exactly like what kind of nutrients are in there, minerals, everything. all that stuff. Everything. Yeah. Pesticides, if it's safe. You saw, did you see the 3D printed house? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Fucking nuts, Fucking right? right? 24 hours. 24 hours and under 10,000 grand. To yeah. print yourself That's out. amazing. Boom. Now imagine, print your own shoe, your own clothes. Dude, that's that's definitely a direction things are going. Yeah, right? So I don't think there's going to be, I don't think there would even be a market for socialized anything when it's like so direct, so, I mean, the cr- most powerful decentralizer we've ever seen. Yeah, but I think we'll see more even, I, I think that drives even more of a split between the upper and lower end. Hmm. So here's what happens with Because you that. either figure it out or you drown. So here, so here's what's happened so far and what is continuing to happen. Does the gap between the ultra wealthy and and the lower class grow? Yes. Do all classes go up significantly? Yes. It, this is a fact. Is, is it, this is statistical my, fact. my question would be, is it necessary that it does that anyways? Maybe that's the way it's, it has to go. For, for us to truly continue to evolve and better is you got to have that kind it's of... A, it's, a, it's called a Pareto distribution. So in, this is in any creative field, you have a small percentage of people who create most of the work. Mm-hmm. So if you go to like music... There's a lot of musicians, but if you look at all the like, uh, you know, Grammy war, uh, you know, winning music, a small percentage of yeah, artists or the producers that actually produce like right. a few albums that are the ones right. that everybody you know are iconic. Yeah, technology uh, investments, any of that stuff. And and here's a good, here's a great example. Let's say you're, let's say you're, you know, lower middle class, and you have a thousand dollars to invest in the market. And let's say I'm super rich, and I have. A hundred thousand, or or even a million dollars to invest in the market, and you and I both invested identical, exactly the same. You put a thousand in, in the exact same investments, I put a million in, and we both go up ten percent. How much money did you make? How much money did I make? So now the gap between you and I has gotten larger, right? But we've both gone up, and so what we find is if you go to a place like North Korea and you eliminate the, forget the government because they're the government. The difference between government officials and the and the average person is massive, right? And that's the difference between you starve and you have food. But let's just look at the average people. Lots of equality, very little between them, lots of poverty, very little mobility, very little opportunity. I right. feel like there's going to be a lot more opportunity in general, whether people want to like succumb to it or not, Like especially with the way that we're disrupting everything to free people up as far as now we can be creative again. And, and the create, creative process, the artistry is going to become way more valuable because it's unique and it's yeah. something that's you know, like an asset versus... Sure, you know, the some- problem we can't run into, though, is we're starting to see like major infrastructure crash in the country, like bridges are falling and other shit that's... Oh, old. yeah, yeah. That will always and, be Yeah, something. but we don't have the workforce that we did that used to build all those things. We're going to be able to 3D print them real soon. Here. Yeah, that's the thing. <laughs> in less I'm than 24 now. Fly, yeah. o- fly over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, really. Fly fly over well, that's where we're going. Is we're, Yeah, we're trying to get to that point where we have these machines and this AI coming in to kind of... Can't know, trust her. Do the infantry. <laughs> <I've seen too laughs> Skynet, of man. Yeah. Yeah. I'll tell you what. We, it's coming. You're, you're a little younger than I am, uh, but when we were kids, being an entrepreneur wasn't... So like if you wanted to be an entrepreneur in the 1980s and 90s, uh, maybe even early 2000s, it usually meant you started a, a business, you had a storefront. It wasn't yeah. sexy. It yeah. wasn't sexy. You started a storefront. You probably would need to either get a loan or borrow money. It, it, you mean go to a bank and like have to explain a thing yeah. and hope the lady <laughs> liked you? Exactly. Yeah. And not now they just go like, what's your social? Yeah, exactly. 
All right. Yeah. But it would cost like, you know, fifty thousand, a hundred thousand, yeah. two hundred thousand dollars. You have to sink this money in, then you'd you'd have to serve your local community, because a storefront was like your local community, try and make it work, whatever. Today to open a bit look, you want to start a podcast, five hundred dollars worth of equipment, done. Yeah. You oh, start for a podcast. Sure, right? It's crazy. And kids today, it's so cool to be an entrepreneur now. It wasn't like that when we were kids. Well, it seems that it's really cool to say you're an entrepreneur. Right. The actual work that comes oh, yeah, along with sure. any of it, right? I mean, that's... It's kind of a dirty word in that respect. Yeah, it's... Uh, yeah. Like, I just, I'd rather just tell people I don't know that I'm unemployed. <laughs> <laughs> it's did you know you wanted to be an entrepreneur or, or did it just start to happen for you? Yeah. You know, that was never something I really thought about, right? But then I looked so back So you had no desire. It. Well, but I looked back at it and the first thing I did out of college was I opened a bicycle shop. I did the whole brick and mortar oh, and got a loan and sunk right. money mm-hmm. into it and did, did that whole thing. And this is way better. <laughs> yeah. 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 So you was knew- it when was it when you were competing that uh, you know traveling and all that you became somewhat got the itch for it like somewhat nomadic about it? No, it really had like I was happy with the last job I had. It, you know, it was, it was great. I had free time and it paid very well, and no one really bothered me. And you know, which is rare to begin with, but and that was medical. You sold medical? No, stuff? I sold uh, pet- stuff in the petroleum field. Oh, that's the right. uh, oil and gas plants, right. and so. Like, Talk about a, a big market, by the way. Oh, well, especially if you're down there. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's where you're going to work. Oh, yeah. If you were, if you want a job along the Gulf Coast that pays well, you're going to work in oil and gas. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, so I was doing that with the Highland Games and just needed creative outlet. And so creative outlet became doing some writing and trying to, you know, explain programming to other people trying to throw and this and that. And then I was like, oh, well, I guess I wrote a book. Well, then we'll publish that. And we're able to self-publish it. You're right. You know, because of the way the market is, I could use a site like CreateSpace or something like that. And I can... You self-published it? Yep. Mm. Self-published, put out a book. It's mine. Yeah, I didn't have to go confuse someone about what it is I'm trying to sell. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so give them a massive chunk of yeah, it. Yeah, just here. awful. And then, you know, a couple books later, and then, you know, enough, you know, from my market and, and, and customer base asking me to make a thing, you know, with shirts or whatever it is, we, we make them. Right. And so it really just kind of rolled into, I hadn't never planned on this being what I do for a living, but I mean, here we are. Do you have, uh, do you feel like some of your competitive side, does it uh, transcend into the business? Like, oh, do- of course it does. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, I can look at like monthly and daily sales and stuff like that. And I rarely look at it as whatever the number is, right? Like that it's an actual amount of money. It's just a high score that I'm trying to beat. Yeah. Every month. Right, right. Like, what do we do to beat that? Like, we need 50 more sales to beat last month. Can we do a, you know, do a sale? It doesn't make any sense financially to do something like that. <laughs> like, fuck that. We need better. <laughs> we need better. <laughs> Get the numbers. Go. I want to win. Crush goal. Yeah. I want to win. Yeah. You're, you're a really self-aware dude. winning? A, no one knows. A fun guy <laughs> who keeps things real. So I'd love to ask a question like this to you is, you know, what are you, what are you currently struggling with personally and with the business that you're like currently working on? So one of the changes with the business is trying to figure out like, Stick to what you're good at and then hire people. S- explain to- that. Like, what, what, how did you come to that? Well, so, you know, one of the things we were lucky to do in the beginning was, you know, the way that we have uh, our manufacturing and warehousing's done in Kansas uh, through a friend of mine. And we realized early on that it wasn't going to benefit our business for me to spend my time packing boxes. Right. And there would have been a short window where I could have you know, make a couple trips to the post office every week. But like now with Amazon, like you can't be a company more that's like, oh, we ship stuff on Thursdays. Yeah. This doesn't like, work. no, you can't ship shit once a week. And so at some point I would have had to outsource it anyway, because then I can't do the things that help grow the business. Right. I'm stuck running the business and I can't do any of the, how do I get more people here? So you would just end up with like a peak. Oh, then I got to work a peak. <laughs> And so that that's helped. And so, yeah, competitive side now, you know, sticks with, you know, trying to figure out how to keep growing it and then how to hire people at the level you're at. Right. You know, I can't go hire the world's most expensive marketing guy to do my shit. I right. can't afford him. But has that been hard finding good people? <laughs> yeah. And I mean, for the most part, it becomes that that spot of like, you know, I, I don't live here. Right. So I'm trying to find people that are either local to me or local to my partner in Austin, but then find people that are affordable for our size business and what we're trying to use someone for. So, yeah, it gets it gets a little tricky. And then at some point you go like, 
can I do this good enough? Let's just do that for a while. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When you look, you look at yourself as owner slash CEO, like what do you think are your, your strengths as far as being a CEO and where do you think your, your weakness is? Strength wise, I, I do the creative side of it. I have a very, very clear vision of the brand and where I want it to go. And then, you know, as far as, you know, everything under that umbrella, right. With the YouTube or podcast, um, I, I can talk like the one thing I can't outsource with my company is hire me, what? you know, and that is the face of it. That is the guy who had the message and did all that. I can't pay someone to run the podcast and be me. I can't. So I need to spend my time focused on the things that only I can do that. I can't pay someone to do. Right. Mm -hmm. um, weakness would be, now I think you, you get caught up, right? Like I end up feeling, you get bogged down in things like, well, you know, I need this to be produced in, in this many weeks and this thing coming out. And then, you know, how do I get out of this? And so I end up doing a thing that ends up more shotgun approach than really being able to focus on a couple things that would be bangers. Hmm. And so, you know, trying to change that creatively, you know, with uh, the guys at Slash that I work with that do creative stuff for us, um, design work, is once I can supply, you know, like ideas for a quarter. Mm -hmm. just let them go. So do you like think like you mentioned your vision and you can see that out quite a bit and with the direction you're going with the brand, like how does that look like? Is that changing and evolving or yeah, you, the, the what change do you mean by that? Like, I mean, it's not like we, it's, we don't have a vision to the point of like, uh, you know, how do we start getting hate brand stuff in Academy? Like, mm -hmm. eh, you know, mm -hmm. or, you know, dicks or wherever else, right? Like I don't, I don't see that. And I've got some friends with local brick and mortars, but I've almost, I almost jumped that, spot to where like you know hooking up my buddy's store with with hate brand stuff is more of a hassle for me than it is a reward right because i have to manage the inventory then we have to make sure it's stocked instead of it's already in my warehouse and i'm selling it for full price but instead now i have to give you a part of it and it's a thing i have to fuck with right so it just you know that type of stuff I don't, I don't see the brand going that direction ever, right? Like, I mean, look, the brand's doing what it's doing, and I hope that it continues to sell more things. And that's really the name of it with apparel anyway. It's quantity over anything else. If you're not mm -hmm. going to move a lot of it, you're not going to make a lot of money. Right. Um, I think we'll move into more cut and sew items and start doing things like that. What's What do you mean? What's cut and sew? Custom. Yeah, so custom oh. items. So, like, you know, designing joggers or designing, Got you it. know, uh, hoodies and bottles or bags or whatever else. It seems like it's 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 becoming more and more irrelevant to be in retail stores for apparel company. You're like the fifth person. Amazon.com, dude. Yeah. I, I, I fucking ordered cereal. <laughs> you know, like, I don't want to go to a store yeah. and then go there and they not have my size. Like, I know what, the t -shirt, I know what a fucking T-shirt yeah. feels like. I'm not going to the mall. Right. <laughs> well, that and we're, I think we're a hair more... I don't want to say we're more antisocial than we've been, but we're going to avoid the painful social interactions like fucking going to the mall to mm -hmm. get a shirt. I agree. You know, or that our time's a little bit more confined to doing the other things that we're doing at, you know, we're fucking everybody I know has got like three jobs. That's crazy. You know, none of them are, you end up with like three part-time jobs that equal like better than one real-time job. <laughs> and so people are busy and, and doing stuff like that. And so, you can order it in. It's also convenient and cost effective. The cost of apparel has gone down also over yeah. the years. So I mean, that in social media marketing. Yeah. I mean, why would I put a store in a town that has a population of 200,000? Now, do you do much of that right now? Do you do much Instagram, Facebook marketing and affiliation I'm, stuff? Like, No, uh, we've got some athletes we sponsor and that's been really good for us. Uh, with working with them. And then, so that's, you know, brings more eyes, brings more stuff. We've, we've started to try to move into some ad space to see how it plays out, but it's just one of those weird things that like you have to figure out the right recipe for it to really pay well. Right. And, you know, and then try to figure out whatever that law of diminishing returns is. I remember some marketing asshole called, contacted me. I was like, you know, we'd like to do Facebook ads, you know, uh, you know, just like two sentences in and then asked me my budget. I was like, well, what are you seeing ROI? 
He's, you know, our average customer is seeing a 10, 10 times return on budget. I was like, if you can prove that, I don't have a budget. Of course. <laughs> yeah, 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 fucking, yeah. All the money I've ever can find, <laughs> I'll give to you. Is that cool? Can we do that? You can just fucking hand over yeah. cash? Well, I'm like, fuck off. Well, it's going to take about six months. I mean. Right. Yeah. No, you know. And you see what's going on. Did you see the, you, we were talking about Elon Musk earlier. Did you see the whole thing with him? Yeah, and, he pulled and, his shit off Facebook. Yeah, and all that. Yeah, well, that's, yeah. I think that's just the security breach stuff. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Well, I know. I good, think good that's time more, to buy them. No, I think that's two billionaire, multi-billionaires. Yeah, two, it's a nerd who, fight. Yeah, who don't it's like it's each other. And that's nerd kicking fight. a, that's nerd kicking fight. a hundred percent. That's what that is. There is no, they Elon, just play chess Elon, Musk, is, <laughs> right. Elon yeah. Musk is not worried about his shit getting stolen from Facebook. He's like, yeah. he'll know that before anybody He's else like, does. I moved this rocket past your Facebook no, computer. Right. <laughs> it's totally yeah. a, that the, the, is don't a, they have a thing that goes yeah, back? Yeah, yeah, they don't is like it. Is it PayPal? Is it back in the PayPal day? I forget the story, but I know they don't, like each other very much and they've openly kind of talked about it and it's subtle what a fucking world we live in the two billionaires can dislike each other <laughs> yeah right <laughs> but, it, fucked. but it actually it actually like it Bro, hurts but you. you know what's so great they lost how many billions that, that was like literally yeah. like a uh probably like a 300 million dollar punch you know yeah, that he just gave him. totally just, totally does it does it affect oh, them we're moving people are like whoa dude well now we get the kardashians that will say some tweet and it affects like millions of dollars like killed snapchat oh, yeah did you like, see what that the yeah fuck? that was yeah. crazy did they you have that Snapchat? kind of power. Did you use Snapchat very much? Uh, not really. You're mostly YouTube, right? I was married YouTube a really long right. time, so Snapchat didn't <laughs> seem to have <laughs> right? a benefit I, it, for It seemed me, like it was for all the hoes. <laughs> yeah, uh, I don't know. Yeah, it seemed like a place to send dick pics to people. Yes. And... I live with the lady that I'm sending <laughs> yeah. dick pics to. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I just, just send them on. I'll over, just show man. her. I don't care if she deletes <laughs> it or not. Yeah, yeah. We, we call it a dick pic. I can live really, online. Really, it's I just fine. flash her in the kitchen. Yeah, I just <laughs> I took a cardboard cutout and put it around. <laughs> <laughs> Pretend it's a picture. Yeah, babe. there. Save yeah. that in your brain. Yeah. Oh, you can't oh, get it? Yeah. You have to download it? It's, nice. it's a big file. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's buffering. Yeah. So in the name in the name of the apparel business, is it... Is part of the strategy because we have you know we have apparel too. It's not mm-hmm. like yours, obviously. It's not the center of our of our business, but is it's more like merch. Like wh- yeah, yeah, what what is the like? Give us some tips. Like, is like speed of release important that you release something every month? Is it like what are the what are some some good so, takeaways for us? For me and what worked for us, we did we did like a weekly drop, and everything we do has been limited. And like we're not the first people to come up with that that you know limited quantities drive demand. Blah blah blah. Um, you know, and the goal was we wanted to try to figure out quantity so that stuff sold out in like 10 days. You know, so we would drop something else in two weeks. And so you keep that spike coming because you've got essentially two types of customers. You've got customers that have already bought shit from you and that are probably going to buy more. And you've, you know, and, the, and your hardcore customer falls in that group too. These are the people that are going to buy everything you drop no matter what it is. Right. Mm-hmm. And then you've got new customers. And so there's going to be less of these people than the people who have already shown up. And so I got to appease them too and keep giving them something new to buy Mm -hmm. while having something for these guys. Right. You know? And so how do you, what's the difference between them in terms of how you're designing stuff? Is it, is it just when you're focusing on the ones that you've, you've always had that you kind of stay on a theme. And then when you're getting new people, you're trying to, no, we've really design wise, we've really just done whatever the hell we wanted to. Okay. Uh we haven't really looked at it that way as far as targeting new Got people it. or not, right? Um stuff that actually says hate brand sells better than stuff that doesn't. Mm-hmm. Um, All spelled out. Yeah. No, uh I mean e- either way, as long as the shirt says the actual name of the brand on it, mm. that seems to be a thing that'll sell better. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, have we found that too with ours? If it says uh, mind I don't know. pump. I don't know about that. I have to look into that. Yeah. Uh, when you, you said something interesting, I want to talk about this a little more. So you, you do a release and you figure out and the way you figure this out is based on your previous sales. Yeah. How many of these shirts I need to make in order to estimate ten, yeah, ten days. It's ten days. But every two weeks, you do a new shirt drop. Yeah, th- and we did that almost weekly for like two years. And that we and dropped that, a new item every week. And that single strategy right there, you say, makes a huge impact in sales. I, I think it helped us a lot, you know, with, with our market. I mean, you, I think everyone's a little different, right? And you got to kind of answer to what your customer base is asking for. It doubled ours. Yeah, and if mm-hmm. our customer base was willing to con- 
keep buying stuff from us. Yep. Let's keep giving them shit to buy. Yeah, you right. told us that the first time. How long ago was it that we, we hung out with you? Five months ago. Yeah, five day, months? yeah. So when we talked to you five months ago, I remember you making that point to us. Uh, I don't know. I think it was off air. Mm-hmm. And then we went and saw Drama yep. um, uh, down in LA. And he talked a little bit about something like that too. And yeah, we implemented it. And yeah, I mean, it works. Yeah, it right? absolutely Definitely works. And that helps. Like it, For me... Like I like the creative side. I like making new things to to produce, and so like I, I don't want to have the same thing out for six months, mm-hmm. right? You know, because then it gets stale and it gets old. Like, right. no nah, man, let's all right, shelf that one. Let's go to the next. Mm-hmm. What are, if you found things that like? So, for example, for us, I know like hats and hoodies are like terrible margins on those, and mm-hmm. they just don't sell as well as teachers. Are there certain things that you've found that like? These type of items people love. These items tend right, to be, like act, like more focus on the soft versus the heavy, or um, you know whatever. <sighs> t-shirts are always going to sell. Mm-hmm. So t-shirts always do really well for us, but that's you know that's a fixed margin. We're all selling t-shirts. Mm-hmm. Um, you know the higher dollar items. Yeah, you know some of them, uh, some hoodies are better than others, and then windbreakers and any of that. But you got to do those higher end specialized items too to kind of reward the other people that are that are in. Mm. Right. Or maybe even spark that new new audience coming, right? right? That wants to. You just oh, keep shit, the amount small. Right? Yeah, you just keep it because I want it to sell out. Yeah. What I don't want to do is eat half of them. Right. Mm-hmm. Because they sat on the shelf and then have to do a weird sale down the road. Do you do pre orders at all? Like, nah, like specialized we, we, items? We started that way. Yeah. So the first three drops we did and actually, you know, funded the business was we did a pre order and then whatever profit we had left over from it, we bought stock. Mm. And then had shirts to sell. Mm-hmm. And so that, I mean, that's how we got the business going. Now, when you're trying to get new customers, what's your, what's your, been your most effective method of, of getting new customers? Is it just through your YouTube or? YouTube's a big help, right? Um, and then doing this, like the fact that I'm never home, you know, I'm out being on other people's platforms and, and I'm not. And you can the, track that. You can see specific. Yeah, you can that. definitely see where it spikes, right? Like mm-hmm. from from new traffic and always being outgoing and either being, you know, a collaboration on Mark Bell's YouTube. You know, that's a almost a, well over a three hundred thousand subscriber base, or mm-hmm. going to be on somebody's podcast who has a bunch of followers. Doing those type of things really helps a lot. Um, and then the other side of it too is you got to be doing a thing that people want to follow. Right. And so like attracting more followers, I think, too, was, you know, the fact that the athletes that we have that we sponsored are are into what we're doing, you know, that we handpicked them. We didn't just go shop Instagram hoes that don't care what we're doing. So you didn't just look at, oh, they got a big following. Yeah, because, I mean, sometimes it's bullshit. That's true. Mm -hmm. And who are your sponsored athletes, by the way? uh, We've got like 16 of them. So I'm not going to ruin running down through that. (laughs) (laughs) You don't want to forget anybody. (laughs) But. I mean, that's really where we see it, you know, is the discount code use and then reward those athletes. Uh, you know, it, it's kind of funny as you see businesses go different directions. And instead of trying to more uh, go vertical with integration with us, like trying to get a warehouse and start printing and doing this, we hired sales reps, which are essentially what athletes are. Right. And so, I mean, the better sales reps you hire, they generate sales. Right. And then you can reward them for being part of it. So it, these aren't the sponsored athletes. These are separate. No, no, no. no. Oh, they are. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Just essentially, that's what they are. Right. Got it. Because we haven't, so we haven't done any th- any of that where we sponsor people right. through social media and stuff like that. And it's interesting because, you know, as you're, t- you're you know, this is obviously it's what works because a lot of people do it. How big of an impact do they make? Or, you know, is it a big impact? For like, me, yeah, it's huge. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. And that's. Do you think that would help someone like us? Like if we wanted to sell more apparel, to have, I don't know, man. I think it's, the- I think it's a different thing. Like, I mean, yes, we both sell T-shirts with stuff on them, sure, right? But you guys are selling, we're selling our our, uh, our brand, but it's podcasting, which is totally different, yeah, than right? But a, it's a not an apparel matters. brand. Well, yeah, it's not. A, there's not a message behind the brand, yeah. the name, not like that, exactly, right? So, I mean, Mind Pump is is y'all, right. and, and there's mm-hmm. a lot of message and meaning between different stuff, but it's not it's separate entity. You know, whereas like I'm not selling um so merch for the podcast. Right, right. That would be merch. That's exactly the best way to say it. Yeah. That I didn't I didn't start a podcast based off of the apparel sales I was already doing, something right. like like with drama. Hmm. Right? right. Like so it's 
you know, whichever one I think is That's your interesting in the psychology of that, you know, like as a consumer, you are drawn to like sort of a brand where, where, yeah. where they're doing things and it's all part of like, I don't know, you identify with it somehow, but that's- Well, people want to fit in, dude. People want to be part of a thing. Yeah. And, and, and want to find that movement or that message that speaks to them. I mean, it it's weird to feel like I am that for a person that's super fucking weird to say because I'm basically just trying to figure shit out every day I wake up and but yeah people people want to be part of something and mm-hmm. I mean if people like fitting in to whatever group they think they can find I mean if you've got a message or something that speaks to some kid in the middle of nowhere that feels weird and out of place I mean right on right yeah but that's music that's that's anything right mm-hmm. I mean that's not new Sure. Well, you're adding value to their life. We just did a podcast interview with Amanda Bucci that just dropped yesterday and and talking about this. And that's exactly what what we were kind of telling her and her audience was that, you know, there's there's this value thing that you have to provide for people if they're going to buy things from you. And if you're having a hard time with that, then you're probably not providing enough value for those people. Right. And that's look, I I've got the shirts and I've got the apparel brand with hate brand. I've written a couple books, but. I'm also putting out, you know, three or five YouTube videos a week right. that are content that have information in them or, and or entertaining, hopefully. That's free. I, I do a podcast that's free right. that I travel to guest for that cost me money so that I can go do. Right. I'm on a lot of other people's podcasts to reach new people and I share information and ideas. So that's also free. I'm doing now free seminars in places. You know, and all that's fucking, it's a thank you. Yeah. Right. And you feel that uh, paying off each time you for do sure something you do. new that's free, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. We notice the same thing yeah. for sure. It's a content war for sure. Yep. Um, when you do your seminars, is it mostly about training and exercise or are you doing seminars on, on business entrepreneurship? No, definitely not business stuff. Um, more life and training's the gateway for those conversations, you know, that, I think uh, one of the things I said at the last one they got a response was, you know, consistency and hard work don't yield success. That That's a fucking lie that we've been fed our entire lives. But hard work and consistency yield progress. And if we can focus on that, like that's a big change and like that type of message. And that's not that plays in the gym of like, man, just because you work out really hard and you watch your diet and this and that, like, you're not going to be Jay Cutler. Right. You know, he started at a different place than you. And the guy's got the tools. That's why he's the best. And there's one of them. Right. Right. Or, but, but can you get better? Yeah. You can be better than yesterday. But I mean, are you entitled because you worked really hard to be the best? Nope. Mm. Great point. Dude. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's the, that's the focus on the, the, the goal and the being versus the becoming. The, right. The, the challenge. Well, because there's no there. And that's that fuck it's up always that, that amateur wants to chase, you know, is that idea that like, oh, if I can just do this thing, Man. then it, it figures it out. Or, yeah, you know, I've seen it with professional athletes and friends that you'll pursue a thing and you get that singular focus in these people that it, it turns into this, like making deals about it that like, look, I know this sucks and I know I'm being shitty, but if you'll just let me run with it, when I hit here, it, it'll fix all this. Right. Mm-hmm. And there's no fucking there. Yeah. There's no point that you got there and you're like, okay, everything's solved. <laughs> oh, no, it doesn't work. I, I tell the story of, you know, working with gastric bypass uh, clients who, you know, you get gastric bypass surgery, you're going to lose weight. You're yep. forced to lose weight. Um, and they would lose weight. And then we, if they didn't embrace the challenge, if they didn't embrace the change, if they didn't embrace that on the way there and it was all focused on just going to lose this 100 pounds or whatever – it was a tough ride for them. I've had them gain the weight back. I've had several gain the fucking weight. You know how hard it is to gain the weight back when it's commitment. when you yeah yeah, yeah. It takes it a lot it is work. it is and it's because it's no different than lottery winners. You know, two years right. later they're they're just as depressed as they were before. It's not embracing that you know that 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 challenge and that change. So, do you what can you tell somebody who a kid listening right now who's like, man, I want to start because probably the most common business. I don't know about nowadays, but I know before, maybe 10 years ago, five years ago, whenever someone would say, oh, I'm starting a business, it was a t-shirt company. Yeah, of started. course. It's like one of the most common. What is some advice you can give someone if, they, if they're starting a t-shirt company well, that'll my, help them? My first question is like, why? Okay. Right? Like, 
I, I didn't set out to start selling t-shirts. This is just where I've ended up mm. because the demand from the customers because of the message. And so, so you built the demand first, right? Yeah, but I think in, that's a, so in a geared, important. it's weird though, because audience. that wasn't ever the plan. Like I started putting videos on YouTube so that I could share throwing videos with the other guys I was throwing with and oh, we could see technique and, and, and work with each other. Like I didn't do that to build an audience. Like you, the first videos aren't fucking edited. It's funny. I feel like most of the, mm-hmm. the people that I have found that have been really successful, they none of them really got in it with that intention. A lot right. of them got in it with this intention of like. Well, I was just doing the thing that I was really fucking into. Well, and yeah. then you find out, holy shit, there's a lot well, of people other people respond to that because yeah. right. it's attractive. You know, you, you, you totally see right through that, and I think yeah, people like passion. Yeah, and, and being into something and commitment and that sacrifice they see from athletes that. You know, that, oh, fuck, man, this guy's in his garage killing himself and training in some fucking parking lot, sweating to death. Right. And and, and he's a world championship, you know, is a world champion in a sport that doesn't exist in Louisiana. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean. Kind of, kind of stick out a little bit. So you can fucking do it. Yeah. Right. Do you know what I mean? Mm. So after you ask the why and they, they ask that of themselves and whatever, what are some, like, objective steps or, or things you can help someone on. Like, okay, you want to start a t-shirt company, you've got a good why. What are some things people can do? Because it's such a, for somebody new, like, where do I start? What do I so do? So my recommendation always is, is, like I said before, that it's it's a quantity game any way you slice it. That if you're going to make... That's very important that you say that. If, that you, if a, you're only going to sell 10 fucking shirts, this isn't going to be a job. Right. So we got to sell a shitload of them. So plan from day one to be scalable. You know, how do you keep doing the thing that you're doing, whether it's you sold one shirt today or a thousand so that you're not fucked? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the people don't realize the, uh, and I remember. That's a big problem. Well, I I remember two and a half years ago when we first kind of kicked up, you know, selling the apparel, it got to a point where, we stopped like putting any effort towards it because the amount of time and effort. Mm-hmm. And when you looked at all the margins, like shit, it took away from the other things that make more money. Right. It took away ever the other parts of the business for us that were more important. And then it was like, okay, if we really want this t-shirt thing. So we had to hire yeah. two employees. So really even our apparel business right now, which I would consider it a, a successful business in comparison to somebody who wants to get into it. Uh, is doesn't really profit that much because we have to outsource the, a lot of the work. So right, but that's how you scale it. But that's yeah. Yeah, that's why it's the only way we can make right. it work. Yeah. So I think a lot of I think a lot of kids that get into the the business don't really realize that in their head they're doing the math like oh, okay, so I'm making yeah. six bucks every I'm, shirt. Yeah, exactly. right. But it doesn't play out no, that it way. Doesn't play out I have thirty thousand followers. If only half of them buy a shirt. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Of course, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's how it works. They no, just that's, all hand their cash over. Right. Yeah. They, that's exactly what I think a lot of them think. And of then course, you, you get into it and you don't realize how chow challenging. I mean, that. look, man, I I've got a pretty decent background in art. I'm, I'm moderately creative and talented. I can get by on Photoshop and Illustrator and stuff like that. But I don't do the finished designs for my company. I'm I'm lucky enough that I'm creative and can give direction hmm. so that my design team knows what the fuck we should shoot for. Yeah. But I have no problem realizing that they're better at this than me and that's why we're paying them. Right. Because yeah. they'll yield more return on the other side. Right. Exactly. Than me being really bad at this for the next 10 hours and not accomplishing it. Right. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of, there's more tools available or easily, more easily available nowadays that allow you to scale than maybe like 15, 20 years ago. Right. Like now you don't oh, have to. Yeah. Can you talk about some of those tools that, well, I mean, <laughs> like you don't have to like store them. You don't have to make them. You don't have to. Right. And there's, there's a lot of places that do, print on demand for apparel and that if you're going to do that like you need really crazy quantities because the margins are small yeah the margins get really really tight because Mm -hmm. the market has set what you can sell a t-shirt for Mm -hmm. um so you know i was lucky that i have a guy that's that's more of an independent that does all the printing and manages my warehouse but i mean now he's got you know essentially two people that only work for us and you know the pick pack and ship department you know i mean it's it's a son of a bitch, you know, if 
we had a thousand sales on Friday. That's a lot of fucking bags to pack. Right. You know, um, but you know, so how do I stay out and, and keep getting, getting eyes to them to keep them packing bags instead of me killing two days, trying to pack them, pack bags. Um, you know, that type of scalability that, that outsourcing is, this is a key. Like that's a thing that it didn't happen. Plus the way the internet is, you know, with being able to reach a global audience from day one of opening a business, you know, I don't need to live in a major market right. to sell shirts. I mean, that's why these weird brands can pop up and fucking, I, I see stores in LA and I don't understand a, how they afford the storefront or how they're selling a thing. It frustrates me. I'm like, I sold fucking bicycles and couldn't get it done. And you're selling like, <laughs> Hand painted wicker baskets yeah. <laughs> on fucking eighteen thousand dollar a month rent on your storefront. Like what the fuck, man? <laughs> I actually think there's really high turnover on on a lot of those shops down there. Oh, yeah. I think sometimes I think it's a really rich they person's raise write off. Money. Yeah, I, I, right. Or just laundering of some yeah, sort. Yeah, yeah or or, drugs in the or you sure. think that oh, if I'm here, like the customers will just yeah. come in. And, that and that, that's part of it, though. You see, I mean, that level of foot traffic still moves stuff. Yeah, but you go into some of like the specialty apparel stores, and you're like. There's six shirts in here. <laughs> no, yeah. That's fucking it. Like, like what if, like, like, how do you plan? Like, if you were busy today, <laughs> well, what was the plan? Like, like, max income you have here on site is like $200. That's true. <laughs> Fuck. But I, I think sometimes it's just part of the brand. Like, they just need to have a yeah. storefront to, but yeah, that's true. Well, you, would, you said it yourself that you wouldn't even have started a clothing line if you didn't have the following or the mass no. of people first. People were asking for People were asking before, for yeah. it. And that's, I think, a, I think a lot of kids that, oh, if they have this idea they could draw well or they've got a brand they want to do, they think that, oh, I can have this business. But I think that piece, yeah. the piece that you well, already it, built it's is It's definitely the most a shortcut. Right. Right. Well, I mean, you can do it the other way. But the, the having people and, you know, the following and the way it all works now, it's sure shit a shortcut. Yeah, I think I would say with social media and the way I think it's you know, necessary. Yeah, I think because that's what we did. We yeah, we started the podcast and we didn't start selling programs until a, a lot of people were begging us to. Right. Yeah. And so, here's but, that, th- but that goes back to the give, right. right? Like, I was able to give video content and give information and share training knowledge and shared my training logs online for years. I mean, hell, if you want any of the books I've written about programming, you can just go read it there. It's all free. Right. Um, it'd be harder to decipher, mm-hmm. <laughs> but it's there. Right. And so, I mean, you you give out all this information for so long and people buy in. Yeah. Almost feel obligated sometimes. Yeah. Because you know, you've been doing it so frequently and it's like, wow, yeah. I haven't really contributed to this yet. So it's well, like, if you build, I do that all the time. I pay you, for stuff. You build authority in an audience and then it's kind of up to you what you want to sell. I mean, right. they'll, they'll, they'll buy it. Yeah. I, I mean, mean, you can't have shit, yeah. of course, but they'll, they'll, if you do that first, that's probably the most successful way to do it. I, I would say is like build that demand, build that authority and then decide, okay, what do I, pr- pr- what do I sell or what do I you know promote? And your audience will probably tell you. Right. You know what I mean? You'll probably have a good idea. Are you are you managing your YouTube yourself or do you kind of contract? No, I do all that. You do all that yourself? Yeah, I do all that. I do all the Instagram. And then are you, do you watch like certain patterns? Is there certain types of vlogs that add you more subscribers? Are you pretty consistent with your subscribers adding? I'm, mine's pretty consistent. Um, I, I stay away from like the, uh, the videos I know that I just don't want to do them. And like, that's the rule of thumb. Like it, it's either fuck yes or no. Yeah. And if it feels weird and feels gross and feels like I did it for clickbait or like, oh man, that's going to be a great video. Like I, it's just not for me. Yeah. I mean, look, it's, and there's a talent to that too. Like, I mean. It's not like I'm sitting on a bunch of golden viral video ideas that I'm just like, can't make that one. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, I mean, if there was one that was the right fit and I came up with it, yeah, you know, I would do it. But like, I'm not doing a fucking count, you know, my macros for the day video or my 10,000 calorie so challenge. So there's not a lot of thought that goes into it before you just kind of document. Yeah, yeah. And Especially then- the vlog stuff right now. But we've got the other stuff that we travel and really do production on. Yeah. yeah, and that's uh, the drift to lift a series. You've got to be able to. You've got to have looked back now, though, to see like certain trends. Like, oh, when I when I make sure to document this way, or if I make sure to 
look at the camera. Yeah, any oh, videos cut. that I've had attractive women in seem to help, especially if they have <laughs> the thumbnails. I know oh, that's, that's weird, crazy. Man. That's, that's weird. crazy. They yeah. should do a study right. on that. Uh, also, yeah. any videos I can have Hap Thor doing things in do really <laughs> well. So <laughs> if I could either be a hot female and or Hap Thor, it would really help the YouTube channel. <laughs> it would help this podcast, too. Yeah, right. <laughs> You're a hot chick. <laughs> yeah, no they love uh, audio media. Uh, uh, oh, yeah. I'm just hot chick with a weird voice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you evolve camera-wise on YouTube? Yeah, of course. Okay, of course. so yeah. you know, you start off using fucking I used a flip cam and your cell phone and other stuff like that, and then that's you know now to having a pretty solid camera setup with a Panasonic GH5 and different lenses that I travel with, as well as a GoPro and a point and shoot and you know options. And then you, you know. go back and you're cutting and editing all yourself. Yeah, yeah. and you, you are get a, a bit you, of a you are a machine. Yeah, you get you get efficient at it, right? So. The, the biggest difference when I have my camera guy with me and we do something is he's going to shoot six hours of footage that day. Whereas if I'm going to edit a vlog for today, I want that vlog to be probably 10 minutes long. I'm going to shoot maybe 25 minutes worth of footage. <laughs> yeah. And so I don't have to spend 10 hours ciphering through bullshit. Yeah. Now you're going to miss cool stuff. But I mean, if you have an idea of what the overlying arc of the day was and what the message you want to get out of it to tell the story, shoot those things. You know, I know I need X amount of B shots to cover up what other crimes I commit in editing. <laughs> uh, Besides uh, Half Thor and, and attractive women, are, are there are your vlogs? Do those seem to do best? Yeah, the vlogs do well, especially if they're pretty consistent because people keep up with it, right? Like it's it's almost like a more formal version of the Instagram story. Whereas the Instagram story, you can just flood with garbage. It doesn't. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter. People click through it so fucking fast. Right. Um, YouTube vlogs. They're watching it. I f- yeah. I feel like that w- vlogging is a, an incredible way to build connection with your audience. Yeah, man. It's weird yeah. going to the Arnold and people like know the names of my dogs. <laughs> you know, but I mean, the reason they do is because I told them. Mm-hmm. So right. <laughs> you can't feel that weird about it. Mm. Right. But. It is. I think that that is a way. I think I think the vlogging stuff, and, and I watch a lot of them, uh, you know, different people, and I think that's what we wanted from reality TV was to f- have interesting people to try to live vicariously through yeah, and, and see what their life is and this and that, and then it just became this other thing. Well, then they, because, hacked, they hacked it, you know what yeah. I'm saying? Well, they, they hacked it for sure, but they had to right. because of production cost. Well. Yeah, and the and the market demanded it. We right. we viewed more, we watched more when more drama happened. When the yeah, crazy, we have kept the vote yeah. that we'll watch the Kardashians lay on the couch like veal. <laughs> That's oh like God. veal. That's essentially, what they are <laughs> just fueled by Starbucks and <laughs> sugar and lay on the couch fueled like by Starbucks veal. veal. Yeah. 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 It's not going to cook well. I won't eat that. No, uh, it's bitter. Gross. Yeah, yeah real acidic. It's it's fake. Too much plastic yeah. in that. Yeah. You know, but but you're right. Like, I mean, the reason that shows on TV is because the market has said, we like this more than this. Yeah, mm-hmm. crazy, huh? Right? Look, I mean, the NFL and sports and people can say, like, what a pastime this is and stuff like that for America. But if marketing found out that they could play a blue screen with a crying baby over for three hours and it doubled the views of the Super Bowl, that shit's on every channel tomorrow. Right. Of course. <laughs> It ain't like we would we would cut sports and play that instead. Right. Oh, totally. You know, so totally. How how long have you been doing? You've had the YouTube channel longer than your podcast. Yeah, oh yeah, for sure. Much longer. Yeah, the YouTube channel I've had since I saw a video yesterday that would have been like pretty early, and that's like 2011. <coughs> oh shit. Yeah. So you've been at it seven years, at least five years hardcore. Yeah, I, I would say five years pretty strong, like really pushing. Yeah. It. And the podcast has been around for how long? Six months. Six months like brand 20 new. 20 episodes in, doing them every week. Now, what challenges podcasting versus challenges YouTube? Uh, how different of a world is it for you? It's it's totally different. Like, uh, I mean, especially if like, doing the vlog thing's easy, right? Because that's just kind of a camera that shows up with what I'm doing during the day. Um, but when we, we travel with the Drift to Lift a thing, like that's work. Like we're, we're trying to do pre-production. We're almost storyboarding trying to figure out what the goals of it is. And it's still reality based. We're not scripting it per se, but like I know today, for example, you know, I want some establishing shots in the morning from coffee, getting ready and talking about where we're heading that day and blah, 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 what we're going to do. And then we need, you know, we need transition shots of driving, maybe a drone shot and having that whole thing laid out for the six days that we're there. And we're going to shoot 11 hours a day. 
you've you have put all this together yourself too, or is this someone else on your team that's? Yeah, this is just me and my, my camera guy Brock. Wow, wow, you are fucking like you do. You you're, remind, you're like our friend Craig. You do it all. You do a lot of stuff on your own, right? Mm-hmm. But it's the stuff you love to do. <laughs> Right. I, I, I'm enjoying all of it. Yeah. Um, well, you also strike me, though, as the type of guy, too, that would find enjoyment in anything that he does. You don't strike me as someone that would... I mean, there's shit I hate to do, for sure, right? Right, but right. Like, yeah, I just don't do those things anymore. <laughs> what What do you think that drives you to be someone like that? Because I, I find there, there aren't a lot of guys like you that really do. Like, I'm sure all the things you're talking about right now within the business, you had to sit down and teach yourself or learn from somebody else. I'm sure you didn't have all that knowledge already. When no, you- I mean, for sure, like with editing, right? Like, I don't know. Right. I fucking like, grow up editing film. Um, right. I got a little bit of info from the guy that's my, my camera guy, Brock. He kind of gave me some basics. But since I had years ago when I had the bike shop, I was doing merch for the bike shop. I'd learned enough with Illustrator and Adobe uh, because I needed to make shirts. Right. And so... I mean, I don't know where the artistic creative side comes from, you know, but that itch, I really has to be scratched for me. Mm. And so whether that's creating something or going to do something or producing a thing like I I like, I like writing. I like, I like drawing and I like doing this type of stuff or doing the seminar things or being out. So, I mean, that creative side's all part of it. Would you say one of the most rewarding things for you then is to create a new article or I mean a, a new piece of clothing or new design and see it outperform. No, oh, it's awesome. Yeah. 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 That's the coolest thing ever is, you know, seeing a concept come to fruition and then people dig it. The hard part of it is like what the production schedule takes out of it. Yeah. Like how, how that breaks you, mm. yeah. you know, the idea that like, so we'll have a drop May 24th, I think is what our next spring big drop will be and we'll have many shit that'll fall between right but so so for that drop it's going to take we've got a week prior to drop is we need to photo shoot we need to video uh and do all the promo work to get ready to edit all those things so that once the 24th hits we can drop everything so then i need six weeks prior to that to make everything for production you know, so if we need samples, we need stuff like that. So I've got six weeks worth of manufacturing, four weeks prior to that, you know, and so the, yeah, so the start of manufacturing is also the start of, I need finished print ready files from my artist. Four weeks prior to that is second look on print, you know, print ready files to give that a look and then go over color options and see what blanks match up and where we'd like to actually go. Four weeks prior to that is the initial conversation of what we want to do with this line. Mm. So middle of february i'm trying to plan what's dropping may 25th and you didn't include anywhere in there any sort of photos or video shoots yeah that's the last week okay so that's the last week yeah once we get everything and that's but that's getting planned yep way in advance yeah you have to put in that cushion so you know i mean that's when i got with the creative guys i was like yeah man the next drop's gonna be the 24th and so it was like well how long does it take to make it so we need to it's, it's 14 weeks you know 14 or 15 week you know out from from a launch date is inception and do you, when you drop, are you, do you recommend to people that they announce it and post it everywhere, or is it a more subtle approach to? We send it to our athletes automatically, and the athletes are rewarded for you know code use and sales, right? And right. so, if they don't push it, they're not getting much in return. Yeah, and and you see that, and so you figure out who you want to work with that that's into it. So you try to work with people that are bought in and it's not just buying time off their Instagram. And we've all seen that too, right? That, I mean, if someone's pushing a thing and it doesn't seem genuine, yeah, people see it. It's an ad. It's fake. Yeah. Yeah. People see it's an ad and you don't want that either. You know, I mean, even when you do stuff that you post that is something you're genuinely stoked on that maybe isn't an ad. I mean, the difference in likes on that versus, you know, something else that's a more motivational, you know, genuine look at you as a person is a huge drop off in, in right. engagement. Right. And so, yeah, I, I don't promote hate brand stuff much at all, like via my stuff. Right. I mean, it's, 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 it's what I'm wearing. It's there, you know, so it can be that, you know, bit of subtlety, I guess, or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I'd like the athlete. I don't, you know, like, hey, here's the marketing plan, guys. I need you to say this in the copy and blah, blah, blah. Like, fuck it. He's like, new shirt. New shirt. Here, wear it. Are, Please yeah. wear it while you're going to train. Right. I'll provide you with enough gear that you can't tell me you don't have my shit to wear when you're lifting. <laughs> <laughs> you know? That's fair. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
but it's yeah, it, it's it's a process. And then the problem with that, like that fourteen week cycle, is by the time like I've gotten it and we're gonna release it, I've looked at it so fucking long that I'm I'm done with it, and I don't think it's cool anymore, <laughs> and I don't understand why it would sell. <laughs> That that becomes really tricky because then you're like, fuck, man. You start saying, you're like, I don't think we did a good job here. Whereas ten weeks ago, I'm amped. Right, <laughs> right. You know, when you look at the when you look at the sixteen athletes that you have, is there a a distinct discrepancy between the ones that perform really well and sell a lot of the apparel versus the others, or is it pretty evenly across the board? You no, have a it's, lot of- it. Yeah, there's a ton of discrepancy. I mean, there's some that, that do very well. There's some that that don't do well. There's some that I sponsor because I like them and we're friends and I'm going to sponsor them hmm. whether it's sales or not, right. you know? Um, and so you see the ones that run a clean and tidy Instagram while also being an athlete. That's what I was looking for is like, can you tell a major difference in how maybe one of them manages their Instagram oh, yeah. on how that reflects? Yeah. They're sales. not posting any blurry pictures and, and weird shit. Like the, the people that do it really well are running a business. Oh, wow. You know, that's what they're in. Their Instagram's a fucking business. And it, and it reflects in the sales, yep. for sure. A major difference. Yep, mm-hmm. for sure. Oh, wow. Any mistakes that you see some of them make or that you've seen maybe one Other people, you, yeah. Yeah. Thinking that people will take more than one step to get to an item to buy it. Mm. I mean, so, if yeah, you think that you wrote, hey, brand goods on the picture, and then there's not a link in your bio to get to me, they're probably not going to go too far. Small, yeah. small things like that make such a huge difference. It's, it's weird, weird, right? Yes. It's huge. But it's so true. Like well, it's the era we live in now. Bro, yeah. It, well, it took me four clicks to do this. Yeah. <laughs> when, clicks. Yeah. Clicks with your <laughs> fucking finger. I give up. When Amazon, when, when Amazon had the buy now button, I mean, Fuck. you know how big of a difference that made? Now they have where they'll show items. Predictive. That, yeah, predict yeah, or whatever. Predict that you're up and you on just this. swipe to order it. Yeah. You don't have to enter anything, nothing. I buy um, shit with my face now all the time. Uh, it's crazy. It I is. Nerves. That's more than yeah. robots taking over, dude. <laughs> that's, that's the thing. Nothing worse than like saying shit around your phone and then ads pop up. I hate that. Uh, I hate that shit. Me. Yeah. <laughs> But it's so they true, though, that, that that part I think is so important that I think not a lot of people talk about is, you know, in this in this era, wh- whatever the reason being, whether we've gotten lazy or because that's just the market demands it because so many companies like Amazon are doing mm-hmm. it. At the end of the day, if you don't recognize that, I mean, personally for us, I, I see a huge difference in downloads, purchases, clicks, you know, traffic on the website. If we make it very accessible, easy to get to where we're going, if you make it at all challenging, they have to copy themselves and then pay. If it's not a direct link. It better be something cool, man. Yeah, exactly. It better yeah. be something. Like yeah. porn. People will, <laughs> yeah, yeah, people yeah. will jump <laughs> giant yeah. hurdles. Yeah. Yeah. I'll go through we'll get climb the over yeah. walls. I'll go through three uh, clicks for porn. You mean this will poison yeah. my computer? Cool. <laughs> 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 Worth it. I used to hike into the woods to go yeah, find right. it. You know? Everyone yeah. everyone who's over 30 has found porn yeah. in the woods. Why was there <laughs> always porn in the woods? What you was know, that? It, do you think it's I feel like it was a trap. kid? Yeah, it's a lure. I feel like it's like Hansel and Gretel, you know? Oh, my God. Right, right. So the right. files in the corner. Like, do you think just some like kid Yikes. dumped his porn in the woods, or do you think it's a guy like just bummed out at home and like can't get what he wants, and so he's like, "Guzzle, just jerk off in the yeah. woods, yeah. <laughs> just build a tree fort and whack it." I just, you yeah. know, as a kid, I saw a lot of porn in the woods, but like I never saw just some like dude walking out there like. What are you guys doing with my bags? <laughs> <laughs> you know? I, I envision like hey, a, like a sixteen or a seventeen year old boy whose mom keeps yelling at him right, for can't jerking have that off. Shit in yeah, house. Yeah, 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 yeah. Quit, stealing all the mags on right, his mattress. Right, quit, like, yeah, quit doing that this. shit in the laundry and shit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. If, you, if safe. you found like a high sobriety, high, uh, high society in the fucking woods right now, like, it would be like an archaeological dig site. <laughs> <laughs> Who the fuck has this Some, form of porn? Dinosaur tooth and porn. Yeah, right, I, I think I missed that. I want that physical turn the page. You know, yeah. Until you have some weird stack in your house. Just you got the stuck pages. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. not good. Yeah, We're, especially the ones in the woods and humidity. <laughs> See, I, I didn't grow yeah, up right? in the woods. We actually found porn in a light, like a, a street light. On the bottom of the street light, there was like a metal wow. panel wow. that you could open. And we were walking by and I saw like something sticking out of it. And when you're a kid, this is straight up now. When you're a kid in the 80s. Dude, that's like pirate treasure. Yes. Oh, when, dude. 100%. When you're a kid in the 80s, if you see magazine pages even if you can't see what's on the pages sticking out of anything like that <laughs> porn oh yeah. for sure instantly i'm like oh shit what's it's that like porn we easter egg hunt we open yeah. and we're like oh my, yeah it's, and it's porn. just like instant happiness that yeah, was yeah. great yeah, yeah no, finding porn as a kid is 
Amazing. I don't know what it's like now. Hey, know. You've lost the market's it. Flooded, Nobody flooded. cares now. It's it's market's even flooded. even for a kid who's not allowed to, like let's say parents no, put them on lockdown. If, you, if you've given your kid a phone, right? If they're looking at porn, right. it's the first thing they did as soon as you walked out of the room. Right. Tits. Right. Yeah. Boom. <laughs> yeah. And it's what I did at the boob. Boob. Yeah. At the very least, it starts right. on Instagram. Yeah, they're you not doing the anatomy books that you have to flop over. I remember looking at that shit. Yeah, dude. Yeah, this book has a vagina in it. Yeah. Nat Geo. A bunch yeah. of kids oh, hanging yeah. out in some weird aisle in the library. It's crazy. Totally. It's crazy. So with with the with the podcasting, because it's a different medium mm-hmm. than than YouTube, how has that been for you? Has it has, what are the challenges? I really about? like it. Do you like it better than YouTube? Yes. You to, okay. Yeah. Me personally, I like doing the podcast a lot because I like the long long form conversation. I also like I don't really have to edit it. Yeah. yeah. Right. You know, so I'm just posting long conversations. Um but like I'm a talker. I, I like doing this. I like communicating this way. Um, the YouTube thing becomes a drag. Like there's nothing worse than watching yourself do things from 48 hours ago. Like, <laughs> I just like, yeah, I was there. Just don't yeah. give a shit. Yeah. yeah. And so I, I could see outsourcing that would be great. But like the podcast I like because I, I do have interesting, awesome people in, in my world and that I get to experience and I want to have those conversations with them. And I think I'm really fortunate that I have friends that other people want to hear from. And so, I mean, if I get to be kind of a cool vehicle to help expose or, you know, bring a conversation up that somebody listened to and changed their day, like, fuck dude, that's rad. It is. Yeah. yeah. What are you learning about yourself right now as you're, as you're podcasting more and more, like, do you catch certain habits that you do? You're like, fuck, I wish I wouldn't do that as yeah. much. Yeah. What are you uh, doing? The worst is just trying not to talk over people because I'll do it because I get excited Mm -hmm. about a thing, but it's like in the middle of a diatribe. And so it's like, fuck, get done so that I can say this thing and try not to be in that part where I'm always just thinking about the next thing I want to say and actually be in the conversation gets tricky. That's a, that's a big one right there. And that's, Mm -hmm. I can always tell a difference from when we get interviewed by people like the ones that are really skilled have that ability. Otherwise, it sounds like a, a canned interview the whole time. Right, right. It's like you have these. It, it, it sound, I'm talking about my childhood, and all of a sudden you ask me about sales. You know, right, it's yeah, like, yeah. whoa, where did that go? Where did that uh, come from? Yeah. Like, you know, it just. And I think that makes a big difference for a listener. As a listener, I think when you get sucked into some of these conversations in your car or if in your headphones, you get deeper and deeper and deeper. And then if you have an interviewer who takes a left really hard, I think that like, blah, kind of, yeah, went, it's a shock, right? Yeah, it for shocks sure. the audience for a second. I think they kind of come out of that uh, because, flow state for a minute. You know? It sounds like an interview instead of a conversation is what it is. Right. And I, I want to have conversation. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, you know, the big compliments I, I've gotten from people doing them and, and I like the way that I, I've done it, right? Like the studio setting like this. I mean, if this was my reality, this is fucking rad, but, I'm traveling to go see people. And so I use, you know, wireless lav mics. And, you know, a lot of times we're at an Airbnb sitting around or something like that. And people fucking forget they're being recorded. Yeah. Which is great. Yeah. And which is ideal. Right. Yeah. This makes that harder. <laughs> yeah. You know, having the microphone mm-hmm. feels more produced. Yeah. And I mean, look, I'm again doing the best with the tools I have to accomplish the goal I want. Right. Right. You know, if, if I lived in a place that I was, if I lived in Venice, I'd have a fucking studio. Right. Because someone's always going to be there I could talk to. Oh, yeah. I mean, we go to L.A. It's every, ridiculous. We go right? to L.A. every month. Yeah. yeah. It's L- just, LA's it's so just worth a nece- it. necessary evil. Yeah. It is. It, 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 it is where everybody evil. is. That, yeah. In for, media. This, for this space. Right. It's like, sure. oh, you mean I can accomplish 10 things today yeah. that at home I have to wait to do over three months. Right. right. Like, right. yeah, I just fucking go. But then you have to live in L.A. So, oh. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's. Trying you don't. to avoid you it just all show costs. up once show up like once a month for about three, four Take a days shower, and fucking home. leave. Yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Just get a spot in Venice and pretend you're not in LA. Who's been uh some of your favorite guests over the last because we haven't seen you for about five months, so you've yeah, had so, a few episodes. Yeah, so you guys were like probably episode two or three. Were we really? Right? Oh, yeah, it would have no been like shit. that early on. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Wow. Oh, that um, was early. Really good episodes. Uh I had a surprisingly really good episode with uh Andy Golpin. Oh, oh yeah, he's a great guy. Yeah, he's yeah, yeah. great, right? And good dude. Super smart guy. I was nervous going into it that it would get very nerdy and technical, but he's not yeah, like that. Yeah, no, he was a regular dude. Yeah. And so we we hit it off and talked a ton, and I really, really enjoyed that conversation. Um that was one I was surprised about. Um other really cool ones are I got a chance to interview my tattoo artist for, you know, an hour forty five minutes while he was working on it. Oh, me. you were saying that, that's right. While you were getting a yeah, tattoo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I mean that was cool because 
I mean, he's he's a stud. He's at top of the hill doing what he's doing. And so, I mean, that's interesting. Like, what are your big picture goals? And how do you how do you keep pushing yourself to get better when you're on top of that hill? Mm-hmm. And then, you know, how do you technically get better at a thing? You know, how do you, where's your drive to keep that? And so those those conversations are cool. Uh, I got to talk with Jim Windler uh, while we were up in Ohio for the Arnold. And that podcast went, you know, four hours long. Yeah. Talked about all kinds of weird shit. Are you <laughs> noticing anything like in particular with – you know, uh, an episode being downloaded a lot or not so much? Is there certain things that you're I, like? I'm so early into it, right? That everything is still just climb. Yeah, yeah. Where every episode is just right at or a little bit better than the one before, especially if the guest is someone people know. That's a really good sign right now. I mean, right. Yeah, it's exciting. You know, I have, uh, you know, like a like the lady who's a CEO or uh, one of the owners of PowerDot. It's a great conversation, but she doesn't have the following. Like she doesn't have a you know, one and a half million following like Nico does. That'll be a dip in probably downloads. Right. But the conversation's still good. Yeah. And so the people that listen to it are still going to like it, you know? And so I think there's a balance, right. To try to have people on your show that interest you and can maybe bring you to a new audience is part of the thing or expose you to a bigger audience and then you've got to sometimes be on the other side of that, too, where you think people are rad and you want to expose them to a bigger audience. Right. Or the information's just fucking good and you just want to share an awesome conversation. I mean, I think when, when they both mix, that's when you hit the, the triple or the home run. You know, Right. It's, 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 like in, it's like having my wife on, right? Like, I want to do a couple with her. And I mean, she doesn't have a thing to promote. This is just something I think would be interesting that people might get something out of. Right. And so, I mean, there's strategy to it, but sometimes you also just say fuck that too. No, I agree. I I agree. I think the our audience. I think we now we've been able to measure this, and it can't. We, sometimes the biggest name with the biggest following does not Nothing. perform. Well, the best. sometimes they don't promote it. Right. Like, it gets weird, right? And that's a big yeah. part of it too. Is that it's got to be pushed on both sides. Do you get that a lot? Do you get a lot of? Do you get like some of these guys? Because I know you're like us, where that's not even something that we ask. It's just right, like, I don't either. Right, you. I, I will send over the information. Do it as you want. I don't care. I got the conversation. That's what I wanted. Right. This is this is purely fucking selfish for me. I get to travel the way I want to, and I get to fucking talk to people I'd like to have conversations with. Right. Right. You know, and from there, the people that I like, I end up building a regular relationship with, and they're fucking friends. Right. And that's really what I want. Right. Is more awesome people around that make me want to keep pushing the needle mm. to do more awesome shit. Do you mm-hmm. do you feel though there are a lot of times these bigger guests that you've interviewed like that, they just they maybe don't take the time to do that or they don't maybe see the same value in that as maybe someone like you? I, I, I personally I think could be overwhelmed. Yeah. I think they're just fucking busy. Yeah. That there's only so much bandwidth that they can deal with and it just gets pushed. I think it's a very uh good attitude to have about that right like i, I mean yeah they're cocksuckers out there of course there are but i'm not trying to have them on my podcast <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know what i mean like i'll just skip a week fuck yeah. it have you not aired somebody yet have you had someone that, some that you don't no i haven't i haven't but no, i'm 20 in. i'm still talking to people i really want to talk to yeah. <laughs> at yeah. some point this will happen well i actually think so, at the point where you're at now where it's growing sometimes that's the hardest and most challenging because you know, not everybody does give you the time of day. Like some of the best people yeah, you want to talk tricky, to, man. you know, are busy. They don't have the bandwidth. And if you don't quite have the following yet, it might be hard to get on the show. So uh, right. you're kind of confined to, okay, I can get these people's attention if I fly to them or do these mm-hmm. things for them. And, and and if, okay, who are those people that I want to get on this podcast? I remember that being very challenging for us. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, and, you know, and again, fortunately, it kind of goes back to the kid who wants to start a t-shirt company, right? Like you, you kind of grow with the people at your level. And so because I already have a following and these other things going on, it's a pretty easy transition to starting a podcast. It's not an easy transition to being as good a podcast as I am, you know, with the apparel sales. Right. But I'm not starting from zero. Right. I didn't wake up one day and say, I'd like to interview people and then start trying to send emails to celebrities. Well, you add value no matter what. You add value even to a even to a large, huge person in big right. business, you already bring value to the table. Something. Right. Some you know, something of some sort, right? So I mean, yeah, you know, that's a huge help in, in understanding that like if you're gonna run a podcast and that's something you want to do, like you gotta have the chops too mm-hmm. to be able to hold conversation. Right. And Fucking not a lot of people do. The tough ones, man, are when you have someone on 
and and don't grasp that it's a conversation. They just, they just answer yes, no. Yeah. Uh, no. Yeah. What the fuck do you want me to do with that? <laughs> Start telling stories. No, it's the worst. I like you know? cheese. And I've been I've been lucky that with the podcast I haven't run into that, but I did outside sales in oil and gas industries. These were not the shining beacons of conversation that I took to lunch every week. Right, right. You know, I've had to carry a lot of conversations or smile through hearing someone say shit that I just know is ignorant and dumb. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. For the greater good. Right. Uh, yeah. That's a good, that's a skill, bro. That's a skill it, that you developed. It is. It is. Do you uh, think it mostly developed from that job or what? Fuck for sure. Yeah. 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 I'm, I'm, I'm a salesman. You know, that's, I know that's what I am and that's what I do. And it's, do you remember when you made that connection? Like, Ooh, I'm kind of good at this and I like it. Like, yeah, it would have been like, I knew it whenever I did stuff with the bike shop. I knew it whenever I sold merch from my buddy's band that I could do it. Uh, I'm good at the interaction with people. Yeah. But when did you get the the taste and the thirst for that? You like, like, I like, like, I like this a lot. A lot of that came from it. It's the hunt with sales and like the oil and gas job, it was still exciting for me that like, all right, I know they got a job coming up in 12 months. Like I got to start now so I can have four or five lunches with them and build this rapport where we've never really talked about work to slowly get to this point of like, Hey man, you know, if this thing you guys got coming up now, were you it, taught that skill right there? No, you fucking just, yeah, of course, because you can't just show fucking smash people in the face with <laughs> bye, bye, bye. Yeah. You're but not, you know, when people make that mistake, oh, I'm sure he makes that mistake. Well, I bet you but there's bad people. people at everything. Yeah. I know. <laughs> you know show up your friend's great. house. You I bet that is right. Just yeah, from you yeah. saying that and knowing how important that is. I bet you, that was probably one of the things that separated you from your peers. Was yeah. It? Was yeah. It not? For sure. Right. Uh, and then I'd say, a lack of my being able to play the game as well kept me from being very good at it. <laughs> like there was a certain level of like, ah, I'm not willing to cross that gross threshold. Mm. I'll just not do that. Like, I don't want to fucking go with some creepy dude to the strip club and like watch him get gross. And then I have to go eat dinner with him and his wife. Oh, you know what I mean? Like, uh, nah, man, <laughs> was, you guys that, go have a good time. Was that common? It's not common, but it, it has it, it happened for sure. Yeah. You got there's a there's a misconception out there about sales and where if you want to be successful in sales you have to compromise your integrity. In Depends character. on your definition of success. Right. Well, I'll tell you what, I, some of the most successful sales people I've ever met have some of the best integrity. They're just really good at communicating. Just very good at communicating. And maybe they've maybe because they've held that line, they've got to a job where they get to hold that line. Totally. Right. Where they, totally. Get, right. they get to do something, right? I mean, look, I've also did a sales job that I was successful at that was fucking awful, but I had bills to pay. What was that like? Uh, it was terrible, dude. It was the worst job I've ever Where had. What were you selling? Uh, home telephone service. Yes. At an AT&T store. And so talk about get your ego shit sorted. This is after I closed the bike shop. So I went from running my own thing, Ooh. entrepreneur. Here's some humble pie, to, son. To back, That's some of this humble yeah, pie. To back DJing <laughs> at the strip club at night. And working at this AT and T store six hours a day, or, or for six days a week, and uh, like so, I'm wearing a suit, a shitty suit, <laughs> this fucking this, off yeah. the rack, hundred and fifty dollar suit fits me like garbage bags. Well, like the way you look, I guarantee it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, I want to hear you dude. bring up Bambi right now. And now coming oh. to the stage on one, we got cinnamon, and on, we got on cinnamon. two, with a little bit less on, we got yeah. Bambi. Put your glands together, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Jeez, if you ain't tipping, you're damn shaved. sure tripping. <laughs> <laughs> DNA action tonight at Escapades. Total nonstop action. You were oh, way yeah. too good at that. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Alexis. You just do it asleep. <laughs> her dad was never around. <laughs> right. No. And she's here for money. Hey, you get get a couple heavy strippers come in. You start, you know. What's the craziest thing you saw at that strip job? club? People die. Fuck. Wait, 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 wait. What? 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 We Somebody, had a stripper die. A stripper die? That's yeah, the saddest like thing the, I've ever like heard. Like on dude. the pole? No, no. She was in the back. Doing like a line of blow or something. Oh, uh, she looked like she was currently trying to figure out how to breathe Mexican pizza. What? Uh, whoa, 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 what? So, okay, so she'd come up in the DJ booth while she's I was... She's aspirating. Yeah, yeah, she's dead. Okay. Um, <laughs> she'd come up in the DJ booth while me and one of the other bouncers were talking, and she's like, you guys want any of these? Like, big fucking handful of Oxys. We're like, no. <laughs> Get the fuck out of here. She's like, cool. <laughs> Gloop. Oh, Just shit. She throws this whole them. fucking handful down. Thinking they were like a Xanax. Oh, oh shit! Man. And like, 
looked at her and I was like, you better get the fuck out of here. And she's like, what? I'm like, you're going to be fucking dead in 45 minutes. You just ate 300 grams of synthetic Oh, heroin. shit. You like called it. Yeah. I was like, you're in trouble. And I was not wrong. Whoa. How long did it take for that to happen? Like what? what how did, 45 minutes. And she was in the back? Yeah. Some other girl walked out and was like, hey, uh, <laughs> she's not just taking a nap. What? Damn. Damn. You that's to, crazy. That's dark. Fucked up. Do you have to shut down the club or you're like, keep dancing? Come on. Go dude. through the back. You need to shut down the club. Oh, that's terrible. They didn't wow. mess a set on stage. No. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah, man. Straight ambulance through the back, carry her out, and then no, keep. No, we didn't have a back door. No. <laughs> we wheeled her through the club, dude. Oh, my God. This was not a nice place I worked at. Dude. <laughs> no shit, bro. Yeah, man. It's wow. weird times, dude. Like, yeah. what else did you that's see heavy. there? I mean, did you, did you, did you went see... straight to death, bro. Yeah, I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You didn't warm me up. Right. Like, sorry. You didn't blow my load here. You didn't warm me up like a bar fight. First, it was like so funny a minute. Maybe like a guy <laughs> slapping an ass dark. and then getting know, punched. Man, like, like, so the weird spot about working at a place like that, right? Like is is like a big chunk of the stories that you'll have of like insanity is like in the first month. And then it's normal. And so it doesn't register as a crazy thing that happened. Yeah. Right, I, I get that. And so you're just, it, it just, it was like working in the fucking wild west. It was just a place that rules didn't exist. And you were so well compensated for not having morals that that's how everyone played now is it is it true that a lot of strip clubs are like groups of them are owned by like organizations like ha's and stuff like that do you do you know much about that this one was owned by a old redneck guy named steve just one club it's all uh, he, he owned so he owned the property yeah steve looked like willie nelson big fucking ponytail uh like strippers <laughs> <laughs> obviously uh, this is he always had like four or five that lived at his house yeah. Do what you love. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And then the other owner was this two strikes felon Vietnamese guy uh, that to, to get money to open a strip club started an insurance company and collected premiums for two years for a company that didn't, didn't exist, just collected premiums and denied service <laughs> for two years and then went to jail. Like so that was he like that was the plan. So he's like, well, I'm gonna do this as long as I can. Crew, we got yeah. Real stand up characters yeah. there. I'm gonna I'm yeah. gonna do this thing. His plan was I'll do this as long as I can. All the money goes to my brother, it's in his name. I'll go to jail and then I get out and I have the money. Oh shit. It was part of the business plan. <laughs> oh my god. Wow. Did it work then? Did it? I mean, yeah, he was the owner of a strip club. I mean, I don't know what worked means. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I watched him get pistol whipped by Steve one night. So I mean What? You saw someone get pistol wow. whipped? Yeah, he found out men was stealing from him. Yeah, I seen that happen so one time. That's... He pistol whipped him in front of us and we decided to stop Steve from killing him because we thought it would be more of a hassle to deal with than if we just stopped him. What? It's a dark place, dude. Wow. There's just things that happen in there that, like, outside the door, you'd be like, I would not do that. And then in there, you're like, meh. That's what I meant by, like, <laughs> I've heard that a lot of these types of clubs are, like, protected by HAs and major gangs oh, and organizations yeah, like we, mob. Oh, yeah, we had a handful of motorcycle gangs that came through, but, like, uh, we, for the most part, didn't allow colors in the bar. Oh, okay. Yeah, so you couldn't wear whatever your gear was. Okay. And those guys always just showed up and wanted to get in fights with the bouncers, and they weren't very good at fighting. Oh, yeah? No. That's funny. At least in, in our area, they were not. <laughs> <laughs> they were not skilled combatants. <laughs> <laughs> what, what would be like the typical thing uh, person that you'd have to deal with there? Like, is it normal? The typical guy? person that we have just drunk. It's just overly drunk and too gropey. And so and you walk them out and they, they want to leave. Yeah. And then occasionally they want to fight and drunk people don't fight well. <laughs> Don't get hammered and try to fight bouncers. It's a fucking terrible idea. You're probably <laughs> going to lose. Yeah, there's a bunch of them. Don't get the shit beat out of you in some seedy strip club parking lot at 8.30 on a Tuesday night. <laughs> <laughs> Goal number it's one. It's not a good look it's, on you. It's about no. the like, bottom. Motherfucker, it it's doesn't get Tuesday. Much. Yeah, it's about like the bottom. eight. <laughs> Why are you so fucking wrecked? The talent isn't even there on that night, right? No. Yeah. Uh, uh, talent gets weird, man, because the talent would show up on Mondays because you would only have regulars in the club. Hmm. So they'd make more money with less customers. Ah, you don't have to do the stage work. I mean, the no whales. one's getting paid on stage. I feel like this is a strip club hack. No, this is good. Oh, this is good information. Hacks, dude. Yeah, it's like, cool. <laughs> there's that. I mean, you can, as, a, as a bouncer, at least the one I worked at, like I, I think my friends that still bounce, uh, it seems to be a hair more regulated in a way that like the scams aren't there. And so like one, you know, one of the scams we had was you know, the area right around the front of the stage, like, I mean, even if it was dead ass empty and it's, you know, early in the night and big group comes in and they want to sit, 
And they sit down there and like you approach them as a bouncer and you're like, Hey man, look, I got a big party coming in later. These seats are reserved. I'm, you know, I'm sorry. And they get kind of pissy about it. And then you're like, man, let me see what I can do. If you guys want to take care of us, like, oh, you know, but like, you know, when my party gets in, y'all got to move. So you got 10 dudes. Like it's easy for them to come up with 200 bucks. So now I've given them chairs. Oh, wow. Hmm. These chairs aren't reserved. <laughs> so i've made money there uh, and then the place gets filled up great. and i've done this a couple times now so the whole stage is full and some other chairs are full so some other big group comes in later and they're like book man place is crowded there ain't nowhere to go i'm like man let me see what i can do and then they <laughs> so, so they pay you for seats. the chairs now right yeah. and you go tell the guys and, and you're like hey man that party's here and so they fucking happily get up and leave <laughs> <So, laughs> fucking brilliant yeah. so man it's good times man uh, it's good times. Oh, that's, a, that's a good hustle. When in right Rome, there. that one, yeah, yeah, right? it worked. And and the funny part is, like, I know other guys that worked in strip clubs in different places, and everyone's done it. Oh, really? That's yeah, they all tapped universal, into that yeah. idea. I've wow. now, I've, I've never heard that. I yeah. guess if you see it enough, right? You see nah, the patterns. You see it, you're yeah, like, yeah. Oh, it's okay, funny now, like going to a strip club, like no, it's so doing yeah, it yeah, to you. you. See the man behind the curtain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Going on here. You're not pulling this one on me, pal. Dude, the weird one we had the scam, and this was this was like management scam, which is is super fucking illegal. It's called a uh, bee drinking. And so the way that works is the girls would get tipped out at the end oh. of the night better based on the number of drinks they sold. Hmm. And so, you know, you girl sits down with the customer, the waitress comes up and it's like, Hey, do you want to buy her a drink? Like, yeah, you know, sure. You know, like, so what do you have? And you know, she says vodka or says, you know, whiskey or whatever it is. Right. Well, the shot that comes back is water or right, you know, her. tequila or whiskey. Adam which is, fell for that. I, yep. Yep. I got bro. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. I was 21 years old. Do it, dude. I was 21 years old, man. Yeah, I was yeah. in uh, Hawaii. For the money. She can't get that fucked up. Every year, the uh, top performers in the company gets flown out to Hawaii, stay there for a week. It's a really cool trip. It took, you know, and the the best of the best is there. So it was a cool thing. I'm 21 years old. I'm fucking full of piss and vinegar. Hell yeah. And I go to... This is also about the age I was working. Okay. So, uh, yeah. so I go sense. I go well, the first there to work. <clears throat> with the, my regional vice president, the div- divisional president. The uh, There's all these big wigs. And I'm the young 21-year-old kid who's like rolling with these guys. So I already feel, feel like big shit as it Hell is. Yeah. And then I get into this strip club and I'm a young, confident guy that's never really had to ever pay for pay for sex. So I'm like, yeah. I'm not. Well, go into a strip. This, I think that's a confusion bit, right? That like, that's why you would go to a strip club. And I never took it as that. Even when I've gone by myself, like, it was a place that it's like there were there were sports on TV, right? Mm-hmm. It was dark. There's less people than a regular fucking bar, right? And there's comfy chairs and hot naked women, yeah, and there's tits out, women. right? Right. <laughs> What's well, not the like? <laughs> right. This seems it's all about ambiance. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. I get in here, and my attitude is like, uh, you know what? I'll just I'll talk to one of the girls. I'll yep. meet someone here. I don't need to go throw. Get to off. know her. Right. So yeah. I, I sit at the bar. I order a drink, watching sports yeah. by myself. Doesn't take but 15 minutes. And probably the hottest girl, hottest girl in the bar comes walking over nice. and stands next to me. Animal magnetism. Oh, man. Right? Yeah. So I'm feeling yeah. confident here. And she sits down next to me and asks what's a good looking guy like myself sitting by myself. And, nice. you know, and we go back and forth. And I just, I'm sold that she's into me. Of course. And she asked me, do you want to have shots with me? And I'm, of course I want to have yeah. shots. Yeah. That's how girl. we get drunk and right. me get laid. <laughs> yes. hundred percent. That's going to where this road goes. Yeah. And so oh, yeah. right away I give the bartender my credit card and just open a tab and we're going, and I'm going shot for shot with this girl. And I'm like fucking seven, eight deep, dude. Yep. And I'm like, I'm, I'm part of me is excited. And I'm going like, man, this is for sure happening. This she's girl's totally sober. Yeah. She's yeah. going shot for shot with me. And the time just keeps rolling. Like we're an hour and a half in this conversation. I'm wondering like, man, how many more shots before this girl's going to want to leave and get yeah. out of here? <laughs> dude. 2 a.m. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. 2 a.m. And, uh, and even then at this point, I still think it's gone. It's going my this way. It's going great. Yeah. Until I <laughs> cash out. And my tab is fucking like seven hundred dollars, yep. dude. And I was like, and of Wait. course, still trying to act like a boss, you know, sign yeah, it, no sign big, yeah, no yeah, dude, sign no it, no big deal. deal. I'm going like, what were we drinking? Yeah, I meant you know? to do that. And then I find <laughs> out later on, that was a ten percent tip night, <laughs> dude. Yeah. I did not know. You're welcome. I didn't bring her home, by the way, you no. know. And I find out that that was the whole hustle. I did not know that. Did whatsoever. she give you her number afterwards and everything? I did have her number. I did have her, but I don't know if it's a burner phone. I'm sure. I'm sure she had her phone that she gives the fucking guys at the po- uh, at the I'm bar. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Because she. Well, you know, even then, they would, like, the girls that we had had customers that would fucking pay them rent and fucking do all kinds of shit. Scandalous, man. Oh, I bet. Well, uh, 
We struggled to ever have terribly attractive strippers because well, eager beats pretty. And, and <laughs> right, the whores, the hustle, the whores would run off yeah. the good-looking ones. Yeah. <laughs> Eager beats pretty. Eager. Yeah, that's kind of the rule of what we had going on. Like, ah, they'll do more. <laughs> Welcome to Escapades. They're kind of whores. That's the real deal. That's oh, the real wow. deal. Is that really how it gets down? Then it's at, at the place I worked at. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Eager beats pretty. Yeah, the place I worked at was sketchy, but. What was the turnover like for girls? Is it like the same core group, or do you see a lot of turnover? It's like 80-20. Like, you had 20% that was always there. Yeah. Lifers. <laughs> you're, you're lifers. And then, yeah, the 80% would just roll over. Chicks mm-hmm. that would work for a month and you'd never see again. Or uh, work for a month and disappear and come back. So you worked there, then you opened your bike shop, and then went back after you closed the bike Yeah. Oh. Super cool. Same place? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so like home when, when you because came, I knew yeah. I could walk in. I kept the I still have friends that work at the club, yeah. right? Like a different club, but it's all the same. Like managers and guys that I bounce with are at a different club in Baton Rouge. I stay in contact with them because there's some stupid fear in my head of like always have a fucking plan. <laughs> you always got that in the pocket. I can fucking go work tomorrow night if I give a, if You're I like, can send a text. Like I can go hey, make hey, whatever yeah. some cash tomorrow yeah. night because yeah. I got bills. I can figure out something else while I'm, while I'm getting paid. I'll beat up some scumbags. I will never not be employed. I love no that strategy. Yeah, dude, don't fucking burn those bridges, man. It's good people to know. <laughs> was that t- was that how tough was that selling your business and having to do that? <sighs> it had gotten bad enough in the end that. It was a welcome. They're like, okay, we need to shut the doors. You know, and so what ended up happening is my partner bought me out, which essentially means I left with my debt, you know, and it was his afterwards. And so, like, there was a big relief of when he finally just was like, look, man, Mm. go do your other thing. I know you don't want to be here. You're not, and we can't support two of us. How long did you try and run at that, and how much debt did you? It was about three and a half years. Uh, I, I got out with like 50 grand. Okay, it's not too bad, but it's well, so I didn't have student loans, so at least I mm. figured that out for myself. Fifty grand's a lot when you mm. have no money. No money, yeah. yeah. That's a lot of shit. fucking so money. Man. Fifty hole. grand's a lot of money. Yeah. 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 Period. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like I don't know if there'll ever be a point in my life where I don't think fifty grand's a shit. Well, I think money. that what it what yeah. it highlights though is it was like, it was an education, for sure. Right. Probably one. I, probably I got one a lot of the out best of educations you probably ever had in business. Yeah, I got a lot out of it, and I mean, part of the problem was that. 22 year old me was trying to run the business side of the business. It's a fucking huge mistake. I don't do that now with the current thing I'm doing. I have a guy, my partner does that side of things. Yeah. Cause I'm fucking bad at it. Yeah. And I just don't give enough of a shit. Yeah. That I just look at things like money's in, right? So money goes out. We need more things to sell. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, I don't want to track and do all the number part cause I, it, it cuts down on the creative side and then you get bogged in it. And so the well, more that I can keep my head freed up to do do with what you're good at. Yeah, do the do the thing that why we started this. Mm-hmm. When you left and you got a job at the strip club again and the job at AT&T or whatever. Oh, back to AT&T. Yeah, that's you, the worst job I've ever had. Oh, why was it so bad? Dude, so it, we're selling home telephones, which is a fucking thing. No, one as needs. cell phones are on a rise. Right. I'm at a cell phone store <laughs> that sells iPhones, and I'm selling a home telephone service. <laughs> I don't work for AT and T. I work for this third party. It's like I don't have a desk or anything. Like I've got a clipboard and a notebook. Oh my god, that'd have been torture for a while. Yeah, in a suit. And so I just have to approach customers in AT&T stores and ask them about their home telephone service. And if there's, if I could help them by bundling call waiting or fucking whatever garbage it is, and maybe even throw in some direct TV that I could save them money over the course of the month, which it never did. It never saved anyone money. Oh, that's hilarious. Oh, I love it when they tell you that you're going to save money, Mike, but what if I don't get that? Then I don't spend that. Yeah, but you're saving money. Right. And so that was, like we had a notebook that showed the different plans and like if they move from this to this, what it would do. And so it's easy to sell someone, but like I had to approach a stranger and explain the thing that I did for did, did. And I'm like, hey, you know, you, you would just, it was just high pressure sales. Like the whole model of it was like, I have to get your social security number and your name so that I can make a phone call to check on your current service to see what we can upgrade to change. Oh, yeah. And so you're just never giving them <clears throat> A question. It's just always like, so let me get your social security number and I can assumption check on this. close all yeah. day. <laughs> yep. Yeah, and so 
Uh, and, and, you know, be like, oh, the notebook says, you know, you're at $35 now and this is going to lower you to 30 bucks a month. Right. You know, blah, blah, blah. You know, you'll have call waiting on your phone. Just don't fucking use it. Um, and then like, sure enough, like after you call in the order, I was like, oh, you know, their current, their current bill right now is $34 and the next bill will be 65. I'm like, fuck. So I would just tell people, be like, you know, if it doesn't work out, just cancel. <laughs> cancel like in a month because I've already been paid my commission from doing the, <laughs> you're, you're doing the deal commission. right Terrible. yeah and I, so oh, it's just bad dude if you if if I always tell people this if you want to get good at sales go go sell something with a fast sales cycle which phones are and yep. so are memberships and gyms that's where you know where I came from it's fast sales cycle so you get a lot of reps yep and work and, and work and try and sell something that's hard to sell. Like you get a fast sales cycle and something that's hard to sell. You are forged by fire. Oh, for sure. For sure. You, you definitely are. And then like the, the real tough part of that job was uh, like the guy who owned the company is this little Indian fella and um, Ray Smars. Get him if anyone's interested. <laughs> uh, but like, I remember like I knew that we were just fucking people. And so we would have, we'd have a meeting at the office in the morning before we got sent to our stores. They'd also send us to different stores every day so that when people were pissed, they couldn't come back and find. <laughs> was the that guy the real strategy? Oh, yeah, well, it had to have been. Oh my God, it's hilarious. Right. And so, and then we had a meeting at the end of the day to like go over our sales. And so the meeting at the first part of the day, this was like 7 a.m. We met and went over sales tactics and like had a discussion of like, if a customer says this, you say this and like went sure. over the fucking script and then like would do improv, like be a negative customer. Yeah, role play. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, then at the end of the day, we would come back and if you had like over X amount of sales, like we like rang a fucking bell and high fived each other. That's that's in every <laughs> like sales. Giant corporate manual. Every sales job that has a faster sales cycle, the bell is, is yeah. a fucking the leaderboard. We were, we were where were we when we saw the bell. Where were we? We were going somewhere. The solar panel company. Yeah. Oh yeah. We yeah, were yeah, walking yeah. through and we saw solar bells. City. Yeah. And we saw bells and all of us laughed and we're like, we're I know like, exactly what that's right. for. Dude, it's on. It, it, it's there because it actually works. Because it, it oh, does yeah, work. It does. It does work. You hear the dude. ding. Like, you're like, that ah. and a little bit of competition and like having mm -hmm. like, you know, if you're doing this and then you can move up to this next position and then you're a team leader. And then if you move up from that, like you could have your own store weird third party at t thing <laughs> <laughs> now did you kick everybody's ass even though you didn't like the job i did well at it yeah yeah that's yeah fun. i was me and two other dudes who were very good at it <laughs> yeah and then i just like i just quit <laughs> how long did this. you go from there to the oil yeah okay how long did you stay doing that though for oh so you got that before you got into the yeah oil. that was right after yeah. so, so that this was, was this was i put out a a uh a resume which is basically blank <clears throat> on monster.com and got an email from a company and this was the fucking first company that emailed me back and i went and, and look at applied took the job and did not make the mortgage payment you know yeah i was like oh cool you'll pay me starting tomorrow that sounds awesome i'll, I'll be, be there here. i'll be yeah. there <laughs> yeah. in the meantime i'll find another job best time to find a job is while you currently have one yeah that is true were mm -hmm. you Married at this time or not? Uh, not married yet. You guys were dating. Yeah, we'd been going. We were living together. Mm. Um, how has her support been through? Because that's a her that's support's a radical fucking change. always awesome. Um, but she knew that the the bike shop thing was a sinking ship, and so I mean, you know, she busted ass too, right? Like she picked up a second job that she didn't need. She was a paralegal and got a second job to help. And you know, I was never fucking home because I, I worked at the strip club at night and then did this thing at AT and T stores during the day, and. She was okay with the strip club working there? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I had the job before we started going out, and then, like, she met me bouncing at a regular bar. Okay. And, like, I worked in bars. That's how it goes. And then you work at a strip club because it pays better than working at regular bars, and there's less customers. Mm -hmm. Right. It's easy. Right. It's just weird. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, if you don't have your shit together, the strip club will eat you. No, that's funny. But, you know, th there's less danger than the regular bar. Or, or the, the regular bar has a little bit less danger, but there's not as much reward. Mm. I mean, we watch it fucking chew up and spit people out. Mm. People can't handle that environment. Mm -hmm. How how is it your your relationship changed as your your because now you have a successful business, right? And yeah. How is that? She's she's just always had had my back. That's great. But I've always worked. 
I, I've never sat around and not been you know, jobless or whatever. Right. I've never been the, provi- you know, not providing, you know, when things were bad or we were broke, I seem to always be able to figure out how to go make money. I'd, I'd say that's a skill that I have. I will work. I will take care of these responsibilities. You know what comes with that, though? And I think the mm-hmm. lesson from someone like you is that you're willing to do whatever. I mean, it's like, oh, I don't give a shit. Right. I think, I mean, look, I think what I'm doing right now is awesome and it's currently successful. But I've never had the same job for over 11 years. Mm. Like, that's the longest I was ever in a, you know, a certain field or a career. So to think that this is what I do until I'm fucking 60, I think is insane. Right. So, I mean, always eyes forward. Right. You yeah. know, and, when or if this stops being what pays my bills, something else will. You know, how many people do you think have this ability? I think a lot of people are. Well, I think the, people get stuck too in jobs like they hate and all this stuff course, like, because it's safe, it's fucking comfortable. But at the same time, it's like you got to go through a lot of shit jobs to get to a point where we're at, where it's like, oh my god, well, how did I get so lucky that I'm in this kind of a job where everything right. is, you know, like like it's it seems easy, like I could just have a conversation, and now you know I'm doing this and I'm getting paid for this. But it's like, you know, you, you have to go back and revisit all these stepping stones. You had to get crushed, mm-hmm. you know, doing shit jobs digging holes and you know like doing some some stuff where like it's uncomfortable and it's it's fucking hard gotta be okay with eating shit for a while that's it. right the at&d job provided me with a way to work in another job where i had some sales experience and then from there you know was actually doing physical labor and the scanning in the refineries and then uh realized that like well we get paid some commission on top of salary so like if we have more jobs we make more money and so I just started cold calling people at refineries. Oh, shit. So you, started. you proactively started Fuck doing Fuck yeah. I got better commission if we had jobs. Boom. I'm oh. trying to get paid. Yeah, yeah. Wow. I bet they loved you for that. Yeah, it was awesome. Mm-hmm. They yeah. rewarded it very well. And then eventually another company reached out that just wanted me to do sales. Oh, shit. That's how that went and down. So went mm-hmm. to another company and then did was there for four or five years and then got hired by another company that wanted to hire a guy in that region. Being a sales guy and admitting that you're a sales guy and that you enjoy it and you like it, what was the most rewarding month for you? Tell, give me a story of like a, a just a performance that you did or a hard close or um, the ones that always I felt good about were when I fixed a thing, uh, and and what I mean like is so. Don't like, you give me the PG fucking answer right now? It's not. <laughs> don't, it's not don't, a PG. Don't answer, give dude. me the fucking what everybody's gonna say. Well, like I, 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 never, I, I never got sales, fucking. When, when I never you? got like crazy, you know, commissions off of the, the jobs I had. Once I'd gotten to sales role, they paid a great salary. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. and so like closing big fucking sales and like getting us into a refinery that like we haven't been into before, or like the the sales cycle in the oil and gas industry is so long. Yeah, you said that like four or yeah. five lunches. Yeah, and so, I mean, that's long. That, yeah. Like, that would be short term. Mm-hmm. Like, there's a lot of jobs that, like, say, well, fuck, it's March of 2018 right now. Like, my brother still does this job, and, like, I guarantee you stuff right now that he's plotting is 21. Hmm. And so, like, that job, that major turnaround doesn't happen until fucking 2021. Yeah. I got to start now. Mm-hmm. Like, I need to be over there. I need to be seeing these guys and going to lunch and talking about the plan. And do Total they have different this in plans? So yeah. what about then and in other... And it mm-hmm. finally comes through. That's like when that fucking hits that you've had a job that you've chased, chased, and chased, and it seems like you're getting fucking nowhere. And I'm flying to Chicago once a week for eight months to go take these guys to lunch or, or fly to Chicago to take these guys to lunch and have a meeting canceled. Oh, uh, like, oh, cool. I'll just go yeah, home yeah, now. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> yeah. It, was, it was a fun flight. That's is that, what I was looking to do. Is that how you handle that? Because oh, I feel like shit. you would be that guy. Just he like, got paid the same either way. Right. Right? It just it just gets frustrating. And then you have to play it like, you can't be a dick about it. Right. Yeah. He's like, yeah, man, no worries. I'll go see some other people in the area. You don't fucking have anybody else in the area. You go home. <laughs> that was cute. Yeah, so, order a movie in the hotel room. <laughs> yeah. That's, yeah. Just, just fucking hang out. Go find a gym. <laughs> uh, go get some deep dish pizza. What, right. a, what about in all the professions combined? Like there has to be like, so not just the oil. I mean, I'm talking or the get oil and gas, but I'm talking like your current business right now, or maybe in the AT&T, was there a, a big month where you, you were topping the company for AT&T or was there a time when you first started selling apparel and you broke a major milestone? Um, there was a time during AT&T where like the second level of sales, like that they had, like, if you could hit this many in this many days, you know, then you you were hired as a promoted, which I'm not sure what the fuck you got for that promotion. Um, you know, big, a pen. Yeah. You, you got to have other people report to you with no added 
and money. <laughs> so you get more responsibility. More responsibility. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Same money. Yeah. Power is what it was, you know. Yeah. Uh, but I remember like three weeks in, like I was already at the top doing the sales for the thing. Oh, wow. And the the owner guy had, you know, basically said, you know, like in a meeting one morning, he's like, Hey, you know, I'd like you to share, you know, what you're picking up on that's working here. I'd been working at a strip club for five years. So you had a great strip club yeah, story? No, I'm like, no. <laughs> you're like, so <laughs> my, my, my goal was whatever got me to them buying this thing. I didn't give a shit what got us there. Yeah. <laughs> my goal was them signing this sheet of paper, which means I got a commission. <laughs> what happened pre and post that fucking gives a shit. So how'd you answer? You fucking lied to people, and and like so, like I made up a bullshit you thing, did, and then oh, like, okay, oh so yeah, yeah, no, I didn't tell the group. In the I'm meeting, like, <laughs> I'm like you know, yeah. it's about listening and blah blah blah, and, and uh, so like afterwards, like I, I talked to my boss, and I'm like, hey man, do you know that we're just fucking people, right? Because <laughs> I'm okay that that's what we're doing, but I need to know that you know that that's what we're doing. And you're not lying to yourself. And like, he couldn't give it up to me to be, to be like, no, I know that that's part of the gig. Oh, really? And so like, I quit. Oh shit. That was it. Like that you. was more of a lie to me than the idea of yeah, lying to people. that we were fucking straight up lying to people. Right. Cause it's almost like, that's the job. That's what I'm it's supposed to The game. You right. could just not deal with me. I'm still in a home telephone service. You, you rube. <laughs> <laughs> why, why are you a Mark that came in and, and bought, you know, this giant package that I'm going to get all the commission on. <laughs> why? <laughs> <laughs> it's a home telephone. No one needs it. Like, yeah. well, I mean, you may need it for your security well, system. Hey, hey. Come, on, come on. <laughs> <laughs> this fucking antiquated dinosaur that we were selling to people. Yeah. It's like selling newspapers. No, yeah. we're selling iron lungs. <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> Dude, <laughs> great training though. You, you, Polio yeah. vaccines. It, I mean, it got a lot easier when you were selling stuff that people wanted. Right, and that you, be- <laughs> and you yeah, believed. You believed. Yeah, and exactly. now, way cooler selling a thing that's essentially me. Right. And a thing I like making. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, or or even training stuff. Like I fucking like talking about training. It's great. Yeah. And so, yeah, this is way better. But all that, all that helped. Like I'm not nervous having conversations with strangers. I'm not nervous hearing no from someone doesn't mean a fucking thing to me. That's a that's mm-hmm. a superpower that you have to. Yeah. Develop I just don't give a shit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's a numbers game. Like if you realize what you're doing is sales. You know, especially with the petrochemical thing. Like when I first started, like I knew that. Every 10 phone calls I made gave me two people that would answer the phone, one of which would have a meeting with me. So if I need to book 10 meetings this week, I got to make 100 phone calls. Mm-hmm. That's it. That's the game. And if for every 10 meetings equaled one that ended up in a second meeting and went to a possible job, like yeah. it just extrapolates out. It, and it's beautiful because if you apply it that way and you the more you do it, the better you get. The yep. the increased of the closes, the increased of the shows, right. the increase <laughs> so you just start turning this, on is, our this is exactly it- what I kinda had brought to the my fitness team that I felt that no other person brought in our in our space at the time. You know, on the fitness side, on the, you had all these fitness leaders that were talking about the the science behind fitness, which is good. I think it's important that you have educated trainers. Uh, and then how to you know do their files and track and understanding that piece and communication with the clients, but nobody was really talking about the business side of it. Right. And at, and at the end of the day, all these people want to do this for a living and want right. to be able to you support- want to make money. That's why you're here. Right. And I thought it was step A start r- right C profit. Right. And I thought it was really fascinating that nobody was talking about like okay, well, why don't you just start to break this down mathematically? Like okay. You have to, or I have to talk to 10 people on the floor, which with yep. no pressure, just talk to them. I have to talk to 10 people. Out of those 10 people, you know, three or four of them are going to want to actually have the conversation and actually ask me some questions. That then leads me an opportunity to book them a free appointment, which that should be really fucking easy to yeah, convince. It's free. They're, they're already coming to the gym. Right. They're coming to the gym. They're already asking me questions. Now I've got three appointments. Out of those three appointments, you know, one of those people or two of those people end up showing, one of those people end up closing at an average of this dollar amount. So, okay, now we can unpack your dollar amount you need to make every single month. You tell me you want to make $10,000 a month. I'll tell you how many people you got to talk to every single day. If you're not willing to talk to those people, then fuck off. Exactly. You're never going to make the money. Never going to be successful doing that. But if you start, and I tell every trainer this that's listening, and this applies to any sales job, but trainers especially, 
you start tracking that, you start paying attention to that month by month, and then you don't compare yourself to anyone else. You compete with yourself. You get better at your craft. You see more people. You get more. It doesn't reps. seem so mysterious anymore, right? It's the right. mystery that people well, fuck it, up. Yeah, with. it becomes you know the recipe. That's it. And knowing the recipe is key. I mean, that's the same thing for. I mean, fuck it, it's what we do with strength training. Like, you know, it's really hard to say, man, I want to deadlift six hundred. <clears throat> you know, but well, all right, well, let's get you to four. What do we do to get you to four? Well, we know that if we can hit these markers along the way, we can get you to 600. We can fucking back it all the way out over two Mm -hmm. years or however long you want to do it. Mm -hmm. And it's the people that just show up and they're like, I want this and then don't have an aim. Right. Like, you know, know, a a boat without a port in mind, all the wind's bad. Hmm. And so fucking have a direction. And that way you know how to harness what's in front of you to make it go somewhere. That's right. And and, and step two to that is be willing to fucking change when shit goes south. Right. Oh, yeah. You know, realize, oops, sidestep. Yeah. So important. Yep. You know, I I think that that's something I've talked about a lot recently with, you know, in in the seminar stuff is that is, is failure, right? And that's what I was saying about, like, I don't care about hearing no. Like, no, I'm supposed to. Right. I'm going to hear no so many fucking times it doesn't even register. Or, or how many answer machines I get to because of trying to cold call. Mm-hmm. It would get so bad on cold calls that when someone picked up, I was like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, who well, the fuck was whoa, that one? Answer. Answer. Like, Is this Mitch? <laughs> uh, you know? <laughs> Well, it's true because oh, nobody answers the phone. Right, and then they yeah, answer, and you're like, game. shit, man. Yeah. I'm from blah, 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 and just hope that they fucking will tell you their name <laughs> so you remember who you were actually calling, right? And and so, like, if you can listen, like, failure is a way better teacher than success. And so, like, don't be fucking scared of failure. That's where you get better. Mm-hmm. And so, like, have the be, – be willing to fucking suck at something for a long time to get good at it. Right. You don't just get it – on day one. Mm-hmm. And so, like, be bad at closing sales and realize where you were too pushy or you were too aggressive or that you didn't read this guy the right way. I should have picked up on the things he was saying earlier about this and that, that he's not the type of dude that we're going to be able to push. Right. You know, or that this is going to be way slower and he wants an actual friendship. And then these other customers don't want anything to do with you. Mm-hmm. Being afraid of rejection and in, in being in sales is like being afraid to get punched in the face and being a boxer. Right. Yeah. It's literally the same thing. Yeah. Like you, you can't go box if you're just refuse to get punched in the face and you're super afraid. Then don't box. It's not going to work. Right. It's, it, yeah. And if you're going to do sales, you're swinging the bat. You're going to strike. It's just just the way it is. Yep. And sometimes you'll connect, but you're going to strike a lot. I shit, Major League Baseball, man, 25%. That's it. Yeah. Okay. Hall of Famer. <laughs> That's yeah. right. I'll take those numbers. That's oh, right. Yeah. What, do you, what do you think's the single best advice ever given to you that you've applied to your life now and it's made a bit the biggest difference? Hmm. You know, I, I think it really goes to that, that not being afraid to fail is that, you know, fucking failure happens, man. But, like, you're going to have failures and you're going to have, like, major fucking failures. But don't quit. Like, just sidestep and and make another move or decide, like, okay, that didn't work. Let's go forward. Now, how do we learn from it? How do we we learn from the failures? And I remember being told that through sports and all these other things. Like, okay, well, what did we learn? We got beat. What did we learn from it so that we don't fucking do this again? Right. Don't waste the failure. Right. Don't waste the fucking failure at all, right? Because, I mean, if you went out and the first time you ever played basketball was, like, you know, a one-on-one tournament, right, and you won, you'd be like, oh, okay, basketball is easy. Right. Maybe everyone you were playing against sucked. Right. <laughs> so, I mean, be willing to do that and be willing to always go find people better than you to be around to learn from. You know, don't – the only thing that really bothers me doing the seminar stuff that I've done – And I'm very conscious of like with my podcast or my YouTube channel. So I don't do a lot of how-to content because I get weirded out feeling like I'm an expert in anything. And like, I know that I've got valuable information and that I have the experience and I should be able to share those things. But I personally feel like, like, man, if I make a video telling people how to deadlift, like, why wouldn't I just go get Ed Cohn to do that? Right. I just call Ed. Right. Fuck do I know? (laughs) You know? 
Well, you share your story. Uh, it's exactly right. Right. You know, yeah, I'm getting over that right. because it's not valid. Well, that's why I even like I ask questions like I just asked you right now. Like, I, you know, I'm not asking you a, a direct answer about something that we can debate if it's right or wrong. It's like I'm interested in I know your your path. You've shared it with us. I know how successful you are. So it's interesting to me to hear like, OK, what what what, did, what was this guy given when he was in his early 20s that kind of set him on this path of being okay with that. And you keep going back to this kind of failure. And I think it's a, it's an important piece that a, a lot of young people don't get comfortable with. Right. Uh, they run into it. And you know, the first time they have it, it's just, they haven't de- been exposed to it. It's a lot. devastating yeah. for them. Yeah. And it's just, oh, they give up or they just, Oh, it's not for me. Or we blame others. It's like, you know, I think the, that's why you got to let your kids fail, man. Yeah, the, le- the sure. lesson is to get comfortable with it. It's going to happen a, a lot. It's going to happen. A, well, you a can get comfortable. You just can't get complacent. Yeah. Like, it can't be okay. You know, it, it's it's always when you can look at it as something to to, to move forward from. Um, yeah, that that was a big a big part of what shaped everything. I think I think another really big change would have been when my when my old man passed away at, when I was thirty one. Um, like that was a big change, and like we didn't have like a weird relationship or any of that type of stuff, right? Like, guy got sick with pancreatic cancer and died eleven months later, and it's super fucking lame. Um, but there was definitely a realization at that moment, like, like he was 62 and I was 31. And I remember just thinking that like, you fucking halfway. Yeah. And if you are, the fuck are you doing with your time? Are you doing a thing that you actually like to do? Cause these days are limited. Like, that shit's coming. Like you can be miserable or happy and you're going to fucking die either way. So let's work on happy. Hmm. You know, and not stressed out and fucking anxious all day and doing things and being around people I want to be around. Like, man, at this point, I've had enough fucking lunches with people I don't want to talk to. <laughs> I don't want to do it anymore. Yeah. My answer is no. Yeah. No, I don't want to go do a thing. Yeah. <laughs> but the stuff I want to do, like, I'm fucking in. I'm there. Yeah. I want to hang out. It's never a hassle. I'm not inconvenienced. If it was an inconvenience, I would not have come. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's, but that's. I mean, that's whatever standard you choose to set. Right. You know, that's important to you. And I'm sure that aggravates. I mean, there's, there's shit that I skip out on. I should probably go to, but I don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's wisdom. It's like you, you, you understand yourself on the level where you can decipher whether or not this is really going to benefit you and your time versus, you know, something that you're a little more passionate about. Yeah, or that's just something you don't want to fucking do. Or that. Like, and, what would you rather do? Yeah. Nothing. Right. Alone. And people appreciate that. Yeah. Which is, uh, you know, you think like you're going to piss people off. With well, that at least mentality. you know that if I show up, that's where I want to be. Right. Like I try to be pretty conscious that if I show up to a place, I'm not sitting in the corner on my cell phone looking fucking bored as shit. So what you're saying is you like us. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which is why I came yes. for a couple of days to fucking sit around here and do nothing. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and I like, know. like I told you yesterday that like, I mean, there's part of it that's content and doing this and like having the calculated plan of like, oh, you know, these guys have a podcast. I've got a podcast. Let's go talk and do this thing. Right. But there's, there's part of it, too, that, like, you guys are better at a thing that I'm doing. I want to go learn. Mm-hmm. This is the same as I wanted to go fucking learn when I was, you know, starting to lift and would go to Ohio to hang out with Windler for a week. Mm. I want to learn from the people around me that are better than me and take the bits and pieces of, like, well, this works for what I'm doing. This doesn't. And if you get one fucking thing over a trip to be someone that you get to apply that makes a difference, like. Totally worth it. Home yeah. run. It requires humility. It requires humility uh, to to go somewhere and be like, "This person's better," and I'm going to sit down and just absorb. And I mean, if you're the best person in the room at everything you do, fucking go find new friends. Exactly. You're in the wrong yeah. Room. yeah. Exactly. You're never going to grow. We no. we I mean, we, bottom line. we we've interviewed some podcasters that just blew us away, and when they left, we're like, "Whoa! Did you learn this? Did you see how he did that?" And oh yeah, I love. We that. try and keep them tight too. Oh, I love Same it. Thing. Yeah. 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 Why wouldn't you try to keep those people, you know, in your wheelhouse, like? I mean, like, like Kelly Sturette's become one of my wife and I's like best friends. And that wasn't the intention when we first went out and met the guy. Right. But yeah. then, I mean, he's as much as moved into a mentor role for me as anything without it being, without it being that. Right. You know, that. You just have that respect for him. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got that. But it's, it's some weird thing because, you know, he or Mark Bell or like John Wellborn, I mean, these guys are all 10 years older than me. So it is this weird dad authority figure at the next point in their life, but is also a peer. Yeah. And and so it, it's cool. 
You know, that, I mean, you should fucking have those people, man. Yeah, Mm -hmm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, shit, man, we love having you on the show, brother. I I love coming out, man. You guys are going to do some, uh, you and Justin are going to rip some YouTube. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. we're going to fucking move and shake. The video you guys did together is one of my favorite ones. Is the one where it's switching the ball back and forth? It's still my, it's my favorite, bro. It's one of my favorite. People were really bummed out that I pooped on some girl's pillows. Yeah, dude, that was so hilarious. Not an ideal story to tell You have to keep that one wrapped up. <laughs> Not a proud moment. I, I, I bring cool out. It. Yeah, I bring. No, out no, you weird. served it right because yeah. right yeah. afterwards you fold up. But listen, I know that I wouldn't be friends with me back yeah. then. So <laughs> yeah. I'm not a good. I knew I wasn't a good person. Yeah. Uh, Great story. Yeah, those are well, my favorite yeah, stories, though. Well, shit, man. Good yeah. times again, bro. No, it's always fun, dude. I Let's rip some on. more content on YouTube, man. Yes, content. Let's do it. Appreciate it. Do it. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.